past. So we're the usual five, six minutes late. And we are cranking into the live position now. We should be going live. Well, here we are. And starting this discussion, which I think is going to be a super, super awesome discussion, astrotheology. It doesn't really get any better than that. Um, when looking at religion, when considering, um, I think we've only got a few people that have arrived for now, but uh, give them a few minutes. It's one of those days. A lot of people are suffering. I've noticed that a lot of people have been like under the weather, you know, the last two, three weeks, just about everybody I know has either been under the weather with a cold, under the weather with a tummy bug, under the weather with this or that, something going on. And I think these eclipses and these, you know, astrological alignments that we're experiencing are having quite a powerful push and a pull. And I think it's going to be a big part of our discussion tonight, how the heavens affect everything else. How's my audio? Is my audio coming through clear? Crystal? Good, good, good. So here we go. There's Dr. K is in the house. We've got Dr. K. We've got Aaron. Okay, so who got you first? Aaron got you, then Indy got you, and Dr. K got you. And I'm going to do the introductions for everybody in the order that everybody arrived. It just makes it easier moving around the screen. So obviously there's myself. I'm the Bush Whisperer. Uh, I think you, you might know me. Um, I'm just a shaman. That's what I do. We've got Aaron. Aaron is a imagination specialist. He works with training using exercises that have sort of been revamped, I think, by himself from Rosicrucian, Western mysticism traditions, and uh, a philosopher, as well as a um, shamanically inspired person, which is very in tune with, you know, the, the, the shamanic heritage, the, the organic form of spirituality, which is sort of from the root side. Would that be a good way of describing it? Yeah. And um, we've got Indy Sage, Indy Sage is a shadow worker. He works with helping people integrate their shadow selves, helping them to bring back that which has been repressed and suppressed into the subconscious field so that they can sort of reintegrate themselves and develop a sense of wholeness. And that's the form of therapy that he practices with these clients, helping people to reintegrate their shadow selves, which is obviously the way to the light. Very much often misunderstood the shadow Beautiful brother as well, been through a lot. He can tell you all about what it's like to be abducted by a satanic cult and have them crack your head open for the juicy bits. But thank God he's with us. He's survived a lot in life. That's what makes him what he is. We've got Dr. K, Dr. K, another person who's also like climbed big mountains in life. And, you know, those big mountains make us what we are. He's a specialist of new numbers, especially in language, but he's also very much um, in tune with various different occult principles. Uh, he does grimoires. That's how he helps people. He does these wonderful grimoires, which are based on various different forms of numerology in order to really capture different nuances of the personality and give people a guiding light so that they can get their feet on their life path and know what's the right direction to move. Beautiful brother, lots of wisdom, and what a, what a um, solid earthy presence to have. In fact, we've got two solid earthy presences here, Aaron and Dr. K are both our solid earthy presences. And then we've got, um, last but not least, just recently arrived, we've got the Cosmic Prankster. And he is, um, for all the Cosmic Prankstering, he's actually quite a serious guy. He's quite down to earth. Uh, he's been developing a new system of magical tradition. Well, maybe magical tradition is not the right word, but a magical system of integrating and interacting with the spiritual planes. He's been channeling this from the Fae that have been working with him for some time now. And he is slowly but surely documenting this up to produce a fully working system, which is very exciting and a lot of work. And so much love to, to Cosmic Prankster. I love the way his mind works. He's right out there with his uh, synesthesia. Is that right? Am I saying that right? The word seems to yeah. be rolling backwards off my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> that you must be it. a little bit of mild dyslexia coming through there. <laughs> anyway, sending you all so much love. I'd love you each to to have a um, a moment to introduce yourselves, going round in the clockwise circle of the screen, starting with Aaron. And thank you all for being here. It's an honor to receive you all. The Magnificent Five are on the stage. Hello, everyone. Hope everyone is uh, doing well. Like the Bush Whisperer, Whisperer said, I focus a lot on imagination, and that becomes from a 
uh, quote by Goethe, which is that few people have the imagination required for reality. And as I went out into the world, that's something I experienced is that the limitation in our own imagination to imagine new realms of possibilities limits my ability to communicate. And so I've worked with that with a real focus towards an alignment of nature in order to bridge that gap. And I'm excited for today's topic regarding religion. One of the other things I work with a lot is identity forms and how individual identity forms are reflected in community groups and then spanning multi-generations as well. And I think that's going to come to play really well in today's topic on uh, religion. And it's funny that you mentioned uh, being sick. I've got a little bit of a cold I was getting over this this week, and which was funny because last moon I pulled the tarot card, which mentioned health. And I was like, what? I'm, why should I be focused on my health? It's not normally something I think about. And then I got hit with this, this cold and uh, it, it kind of beat me up a little bit. So I had to uh, focus down to the, the primal aspects and really concentrate on, on uh, my thoughts and my being and everything. So great to be here. Pass it off to Indy. All right. Thank you, Aaron, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you, Franklin, for introducing us. Um, I'm so glad to be here today for this wonderful discussion. And uh, we're really looking forward to talking about the commonalities and parallels between all these different religions we see out there. Some of the roots that we might find that um, they stem back to. And, um, and it's going to be wonderful exploration. Um, in my work with shadow work, I do a lot of stuff with uh, Jungian shadow work to provide self-mastery, um, a path to self-mastery for people. I can only lead them to the door. And, uh, you know, you can only lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. So oftentimes um, people won't be ready for that uh, that healing. And they're going through the dark night of the soul to come through on the other side and find that light within. It's a challenging process. And so um sometimes we need to stay in denial until we have the spiritual tools and support network that we need to go through that transformation but uh, i was able to do that for myself after a uh, near-death experience and i had brain surgery in 2007 and so i try to pass that gift forward also um i, I work i do a lot of work on anthropology and that goes through from paleontological anthropology with fossils uh and archaeological anthropology with relics and artifacts to um, cultural anthropology of the myths and legends of the past. And I explore all of that. So it'd be really fun to kind of dive in today and go into some of that stuff. Um, really looking forward to it. Thanks, guys. I'm going to pass the mic to Khalil. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Franklin and Indy and Aaron and Cosmic. Uh, my name is Kilel Keanu, a.k.a. Konami Codes. I am an astro numerologist, historian, uh, anything that has to do with history. Um, I've always been deeply attracted to. Um, I love to help people unlock their true character profiles, because the only way to truly break character is to know how you incarnate it how you truly programmed yourself um, with all of your traits, all of your faults, all of your powers, all of your so-called flaws. If you understand that you are the author entirely of your life and nothing outside of you had any influence on that, then then what, what truly is a mistake? So I absolutely love the topic for today, astrotheology, which is the root of all mythology all story all narrative um the forefather to anything resembling what what we like to call religion and i can't wait to get into it all right and uh i am cosmic prankster um like uh uh bush whisperer said i am a channeler of the fae and i would I guess technically the term I would call myself would be a Zarfaxologist because it's all about this idea of um, Zarfaxes and Zarfaxes. Basically, they're kind of units of measurement for higher dimensional space. And really what I do with my practice is I, I channel these beings and they teach me about sort of the, uh, the worlds and layers that exist outside of what we know as reality and what we know of as infinity. And essentially, I'm learning this uh, extra dimensional epistemology 
um, learning how dimensions sort of like space themselves out, how things sort of reflect off of each other, um, how parallel universes work. I'm, I'm working on that, which is really, really complicated, but I'm starting to figure out the, uh, the, the framework behind that. And so, yeah, I think I can probably offer some uh, interesting insight in terms of uh, the ideas of the, the roots of religion, because there's actually a, another theory I'm sort of developing with that in terms of like based on kind of like God sort of being emanated from sort of primordial intelligences in the universe. So yeah, this will be an interesting topic. Yeah, I find it interesting that religion seems to be there's the divine connection and aspect of all human beings that we're just born with. And religion seems to try to channel and flow that in a way that keeps us as a collective, as individuals moving through this kind of current, almost hijacking it, you know, in a way. But then once we step away from the organized religion and lean more into the internal self, then we start to um, see the the roots of the origins of, of these aspects, like like you were describing. Well, we got Slick in the house. Welcome, dear Slick. One last but not least, dear Slick is a wonderful brother, and a, he's done a lot of authentic work on the Enneagram. It's really been putting together the pieces of the puzzle. Sorry, I'm a little bit out of breath because I had to ran, run to the other side to go and start recording on the Telegram group and on the Telegram channel. So we are live on two places in Telegram, live on three places on Facebook, live on YouTube, and live on LinkedIn. So we're live all over the world, I think, I hope. Anyway, sending you all love. Uh, Slick Dissident is a wonderful brother and a wonderful student of human nature and has really been doing a lot of great work on the Enneagram, as well as sort of tying it together with the other occult traditions. And his heart is embedded within the martial arts system, so he brings everything back to the synergetic, visceral experience of life, which is so beautiful. And such a creative brother. Thank you to, for joining us. It's a total honor to have you. Honor to have everybody here. And do please say a few words. Dear Slick. A man of few words. I'm sure he'll be back. I think his audio was uh, was not working. Please do continue. You were busy saying. Oh, I I, I didn't have a whole lot more to add. I was well. You stepped away. I was just trying to uh, get the conversation flowing, and the direction I was going was the organized religion seems to hijack the innate design and. Everyone, when they're born, we've got this union with the divine connection and a connection with nature and this sacred geometry that flows and shapes our, our consciousness and how we think and where our orientation point is as we grow and develop. And we've got all these different cycles and stages that we, we go through as we move from being a, a child to a young adult to um, creating our own individual identity and then group identities and facing the the question of our own mortality and religion seems to try to package all this and simplify it in a way that um, steers and moves people in a way that they can be kind of controlled. But the real divine plan is something that humans can't really control. And, and so I, that's uh, been my observation uh, of looking at, at religion and breaking free from my own religious kind of upbringing and venturing to explore different things and asking big questions and realizing a lot of these religions didn't seem to have the answers or the imagination or want to entertain a lot of the questions I was asking. That's beautifully put. And um, <clears throat> I think it's really on point. And I think we're, we're going to dive deep into a lot of the traditions. We're probably going to start like as close to the beginning as what we can get while we're waiting for Slick to come and introduce himself. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 quite a bold statement that I've made, <laughs> suggesting that all religion comes from astrotheology. Astro but I, I think as we look at it, I mean, when I think of religion and I think of the old religions, I think like of tra traditions of Sumeria. 
And when I think of other old old religions and old traditions, I think of traditions like the Paleo-Hebrew tradition that has been revamped and resold to us, repurposed as the Jewish religion, which, as we know, was sold and repurposed by Moses, right? And then again, now in modern times with the Second World War and all that nonsense, it was once again repurposed, repackaged, re day caught up and resold to us with a new language and all of that modern hebrew and all of that so there's there's definitely been this repurposing of a very old tradition and we look at the vedic tradition as well and there's another very ancient tradition and it, to me it seems like the further we go back in history we're looking at a perspective of the divine feminine and the further we come forward in history we're looking at a reflection of the divine masculine this is how it seems to me it seems like we were very tuned into the moon and now we seem to be more tuned into the sun. And so the earliest calendars obviously were lunar calendars, like the Jews are still using the lunar calendar. God bless them for that. And um, keeping it alive, you know. And India is still very much tuned into the lunar calendar. The rest of us seem to be jumping onto the heliocentric model as was repackaged by the Greeks. We're probably going to get into why and how this was done and what the purpose could have been. I think it has a lot to do with the changing of the ages and the moving of the proverbial vibrational field from one polarity to another in the same way that night and day happens, polarity, greater cosmic night and days happen. And in this greater cosmic night and day, there's a change of role of sexuality. Like the earliest moon deity upon which the fundamentals of religion seem to be based was Inanna. I mean, Inanna was the god from which all the other gods sprang in the Sumerian tradition. So you could arguably say that Inanna was the first god. So first traditions that we can track seem to be pointing at lunar religions. We don't know how old the Vedic tradition is, but it's probably very old. Could, could be the same tradition for all we know. Seems likely. And once again, the lunar tradition. If we start looking at it, we see the oldest god worshipped was the lunar deity of, well, it wasn't known as Shiva, it was known as Rudra. Rudra was fundamentals of early, early Shiva worship. And um, once again, a, a lunar deity. And of, as, we, as we progress further towards ourselves, it seems like the switch towards the solar deities, like we, we, we speak of Emmanuel be taking on the channeling of the sun, the being of the sun. And... Um, being called the son of God. We've got to look at this. Something going on here. And how the son would be giving, sacrificing himself for all of us. The way the son just burns out life, radiating all life towards all of us so that we can live. If you think about what that means, right? So the, the son was sacrificed by God so that we could get a chance to live. And that's exactly what's happening. The sun is sacrificing itself. It's burning out, giving off all of its energy. If it were to maintain and keep the energy in its core, it could live for long, 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 long. But it shortens its own lifespan dramatically by giving so abundantly, which is an interesting concept to consider when we look at the solar deity. And then, of course, with the rise of the um, Set and the Egyptian tradition, we started to switch towards the rare. And then Horus and Horus, the set and the setting of the sun and how it was considered in ancient times that light is light and dark is dark. And so if it was dark, it was evil. If it was light, it was divine. And so the light seems to have been a big part of the tradition. So definitely when you think about spirituality, we're always they're all talking about the divine light. Well, light comes from the stars. Light comes from the sun. Light comes from the moon. All the light that we would see comes from up there. So it's very hard to deny the astrotheological connection with all religions. Any religion that speaks of light, you've got to ask yourself, why is light the metaphor? Anyway, that's my little throwing um, into the pan. Anybody else that wants to throw in, do please throw in. This is the time for throwing in. You bring up an interesting point, Franklin. And not to completely derail us, but I, I want to offer a different um, adjoining perspective. If we understand that everything we see in what we call the outside world is a reflection of what's inside, then we can understand that the sun we think we see in the sky is actually radiating from inside of us, right? So 
everything that exists here gives its life for another. We don't even carry our own blood. Our blood is borrowed, hence the term we live on borrowed time, right? So there's an inversion to these definitions, um, how we choose to define what these, uh, what these uh, auspices actually represent and where they come from. And this is why, you know, because of ignorance, original meaning has been regulated and reduced to author's interpretation or writer's interpretation, or the powers that should not be um, their interpretation. Because the more you study religion, the more you study culture, the more you study language, the more you see the similarities as opposed to the differences. So getting to the core of that, um, to actually have a real tabula rasa, to really have a clean slate, you're going to have to go into astral theology. I like that. To go into the core, we're going to have to dive deep into astrotheology. And I think there's something to be said about that. Because we are living in an age of stars. And the stars, our celebrities, sell ebrites. Ebrit. Evrit. Okay, so the word evrit, um, evrit is, is Hebrew, right? And BNV is interchangeable. So cell, ibritis, ibritis. You know, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, those entities from the Zionist pact that are there to keep us in our cells, <laughs> to keep us trapped in the physical cells of the physical body, which I think is exactly what Dr. K is getting at. You know, go beyond the cell of your flesh, go beyond the cells. Look to the spiritual kingdom within, and there we will find that there's a reflection within that is perfectly in harmony and balance with all of the things that we're witnessing in the physical manifestations in the world around us, which is a beautiful concept because it takes us right back to Hermes. And I think Hermes is going to have to come up because the Hermetic Seven Principles, we can't pretend that that doesn't have something to do with the seven days of the week or the seven planets. In fact, how many religions, how many mystical traditions which in my mind is where religions seem to start from they evolve from mystical occult traditions into becoming exoteric traditions and the exoteric traditions think of it like this some shaman go into deep trance discover something end up initiating other shaman and they some people say hey we we, we can find another way of teaching other people this you don't have to go off in the, on your own and figure it out here's a few clues and so they develop other systems, which are sort of a more evolved form of spirituality than shamanism, perhaps. And then they are able to initiate others into that tradition, and it becomes a priestly caste. And it becomes so well known between the mass populace that they're all like, well, hey, what's, what are you guys talking about? And they try and explain it to people, and people just can't get it. But people get a sort of exoteric understanding, basic understanding of the principles. And so the religion starts to form around the mystical societies. And um, it all comes back down to that principle of people going within, the, the high priests, the, the spiritual um, shaman, whoever it was from whichever traditions. And I think that this is going to point some fingers as well at what's, what was happening with the Middle Ages and what was happening with the Crusades, how dark a time that was. And what do you guys think when we look at like the history, and we look at it as a whole for a moment, what religion has produced and where it has brought us to now. Where is it taking us? I like to kind of imagine what if I was the, the first person that came into the world and I was having to view these astrological type events like the sun rising and then the moon going through its different cycles or the, the stars and what each of those brings like i think of the sun well the the sun is consistent it bright it uh it shines brightly and brings that warmth at the same cycle every day and the shape stays the same so it's consistent it's fire and warmth and it's a bringer of light and it changes the consciousness and the way the body feels and makes us active and energized 
and then the moon goes through its various cycles and then the night has its own kind of feel to it where it's much more cool and it brings out you can't see as far and you have to use more of your intuition to navigate nature at night and animals can see in the dark but humans can't and so i like to think of you know how would this shape the person's dreams and how they interact with other people and what kind of concepts they might start to assign to these large phenomena that are in the sky in order to try to make sense of this massive world that's been created for us and then looking at larger cycles like eclipses like we're about to go through there's people that have been around for long periods of time and they can protect that knowledge and then start to set up the the masses for oh look at me i'm going to be able to i'm magical and i can blot out the sun or bring this eclipse because i'm so powerful you need to surrender to my my power and authority knowing that cycle is going to come and then they can kind of trick and move the flow of the masses by using their larger understanding of the astrological events and so i could see how a priest class would start to get developed and weaponize this to serve their own type of agendas yeah i just wanted to uh point out that um our our planets are still named after the polytheistic gods uh, which have fallen away from from uh, actual worship, and it brings us ties us back into the the roots of our ancient past. Uh, but if we look at the constellations in the stars, there's a strong correlation with uh, shamanism and uh, spirit animals. And if we look back uh, at old megalithic structures and some of the artwork on those structures, we see in Gobekli Tepe, in Rapa Nui at Easter Island. Um, there's images of the path of the soul after death that goes back to Sirius and then through Orion's belt and Pleiades over towards Cygnus and Deneb and following the path of the Milky Way back from our inception in the cosmos to a place where we come back from rebirth. And so astrotheology has been back to the roots um back before uh, a lot of the cultures that we're familiar with today back to these megalithic cultures of the past which are shrouded in mystery um a lot of them tie back to antediluvian cultures which have not yet been recognized and we see that um the americas have been discovered not only by the vikings um but by the chinese and um also by the irish uh long before the rest of uh, the known world um of europe uh came in with the conquistadors so there's a lot of the past that's been shrouded in mystery and lost and uh we can we can dive in and try to uncover some of that today now i know um you mentioned hermes being a uh, integral figure in um the inception of mysticism and its roots and uh, he is the first planet of the planets um as mercury the roman depiction of hermes uh which is the greek depiction of thoth um, being Hermes, Trismegistus. And so he's a powerful deity and represents the powers of communication and wisdom and um, ties back to being an, uh, a god of the underworld as well, uh, facilitating rebirth, being a messenger of the gods. So I just wanted to mention some of that, and that's um, pretty obvious right there that there's some roots that tie us way back to some things that came before monotheism. I would really love to expand on what Indy just said, because we're not going to be able to stay within a, the realm of a certain terminology, such as religion, without entertaining warfare and slaughter and inquisition and disease and power struggles and genderism. Um, you know, everything that happened with, with women and witches and oracles and sibyls and things of that nature. Um, we're going to have to really look at some, some ugly places because ultimately we're talking about power and we're talking about influence, um, salvation, like, you know, the, um, if, if you look at culture, if you look at the power of, um, superstition before we even get to religion. 
right? We have these ugly branches that blot out the sky um, like superstition. You have Friday the 13th, right? Which is supposed to be uh, the worst day. My grandfather, uh, Rising Power, Will Barnett, he would not do business on a Friday the 13th. He would not even leave his house on a Friday the 13th. And this was this was accepted. My grandfather was born in 1919, right? So, and he was the oldest of nine. So that influenced a whole family to this day. When, when uh, the truth is, that's actually one of the luckiest days that you can ever do business on, right? So this is from a superstition. He never read the Bible a day in his life, right? So when we actually read the Bible, case in point, we have to go through different languages. The majority of Christians, for example, in the world, not just this country, they don't read any other language other than English, right? So when you look beyond language, when you look to the Aramaic, when you look to the Greek, when you look to the Latin, you get different interpretations. So when I tell you that the word Maseroth has never been properly translated because the closest translation would be Zodiac, that's giving away too much information, that's giving away too much power. And you might be able to begin to put two and two together. The problem we have with organized religion is this taken so literal when no one understands the etymology of where it actually comes from. So how can you possibly begin to take it literally? The amount of space, the gap in between literal and pre-neo-interpreted is almost unfathomable. So again, we have to look at the root We have to look at the shadow. We have to look at the light, all of which is encompassed within astral theology. I like that you dive into the deep end. Obviously, the Maserot or the Mezarot is a big part of the. um, It's a big part of the Kabbalah, isn't it? And it's it's effectively what came first. Yeah. So I suppose. I look at it from like a very simple, simple way of looking at it. I think, or well, I try to. Like I imagine in an ancient time. So there we were, and there was times when we had great, great technology. We know this; it's in our historical records. But I think there were times before we had great technology when we lived in tune with the land, because we had no need of technology. We were like birds. We were plugged into the astral field. We didn't need to talk because we spoke with thoughts, telepathically connected to each other. And our dreams would reveal what was happening in the physical and what would happen in the physical. Prophecy, I think, was just par for the course. We were so in tune with reality that we could see through the veils readily. And so what we could consider today magical powers or siddhi or superpowers were probably common, common, widespread amongst our beings to certain degrees, but we didn't even recognize them as such. They were just like limbs to us, just like a limb, you know, nothing special, just that's how this works. And I think that we've sort of got to take into account that in those times, uh, we would be very susceptible to the elements. Before the 200 Gregori came to earth and the Huti came here and started teaching us agriculture, uh, magic, how to um, document and control these things, you know, calendars. I think we were just living in tune with nature like animals do. And so the light was a good time, was a good thing. Because during the light times, our babies wouldn't get hurt living in the wild. Um, predators wouldn't disturb our, our, our animals that were in symbiosis with us. And um, we weren't in danger 
as we were in the dark time because we couldn't see so well at night. So there were a lot of dangers. If you've lived in the wild at night, it's quite dangerous. You could step on a snake, accidentally die, you know. Not that the snake has any bad intentions towards you, but they don't like being stepped on. <laughs> you could walk face in into a, a lair of a bear and corner a bear. Bears aren't aggressive, but you don't want to corner one of those. <laughs> I wouldn't want to corner one of those in their own lair. One thing I wouldn't want to do, meet them out in the open ground. It's where you're supposed to meet them. So, um, you know, the, the light would have been considered divine and the dark would have been considered as as evil, if I can use that word, a very, very badly um, demonized word because of everything that has been done in the name of evil and the way in which that um, um, would have basically just broken down we got slick saying something what is slick saying here he's saying scholar read legal ah yeah religion Lush. yeah muses definitely so our muses were like our, our profound white wisdom keepers of the ancient times in, in in ancient greece like you could say the shaman of greece they used to do sweat lodges interestingly enough the, the more we look at ancient Greece, the more we see it's, it's more closer to indigenous American than what it seems. We've been taught to think of indigenous Americans as being like hunter-gatherers, but according to their history, they built up America. I mean, go and take a look at that place. It's pretty well built. <laughs> Some awesome structures, <laughs> ancient structures that we try to attribute to some white man somewhere. The racist element as well, I think, also comes and was tapped into by that ancient fear of the light being the safety of time, the dark being the more dangerous time. And so when our beings came down from the heavens, we assumed that they came from the stars that gave us light. And so we couple the ideas of light to these beings. And, you know, Ea or, or Enki and Enlil, these brothers came down or they've got different names in the Irish traditions or whichever tradition you go there, they have different names, but they're the same idea. And um, so we definitely have this heritage of being a natural culture. And then we were sort of taken and changed by whoever came here or taken and taught, taught, made tight. And, there's definitely been a lot of education of sorts or, 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 you know, scholarly development. As Slick was pointing out here, the muses and the reciprocates, this um, energy in this dualistic system of polarity that we live in here, you know, as above, so below, the polarities of being. So there's definitely an ancient heritage of knowing that the light is good and the dark is bad. And so the eve, the evening, the night, when the light goes away, became the even evil, right? And the day, which was was when um, was was when it was good, you know, on. So on was the name of the sun in ancient Egypt, wasn't it? And off. So on and off, the switches that for electricity comes from these ancient ancient traditions of the Chemians and uh, where we learnt our chemistry from and our alchemy coming from Tehuti and this wonderful lineage from Hermes, which we're talking about essentially. So I think it's impossible to extract astrotheology from the most basic of human impulses when we were like crawling around in skins before the proverbial gods arrived to upgrade our knowledge of agriculture and architecture and everything else that came with building a structured society whether we needed it or not is a question it seems like we're trying to get back to those golden days when we were just living on the earth off the earth with the earth in tune with the earth not hurting the earth not hurting each other the moment those gods came we started learning to you know to to steal to hurt to do harm it's like the the bushman, and this is this is something that that rings in my head. The Khoisan people, the San people, the desert people, 
they were here in the Western Cape where I am, they didn't have a word for steal and they didn't have a word for ownership. So when 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 the, the white people from Europe came and said, this is my land, they were like, they didn't understand. They literally couldn't grasp the concept. Like, what does that mean? And when we said, that's my cow, you can't hunt that cow. They, they just couldn't grasp it because it's like, it's, it's a foreign language to them. It's like, what do you mean? You, you That's not your cow. It's the, the star's cow. It's the cow of the world. So this ownership idea came in. And here we go. The Slick dissident is here. Welcome, dear Slick. Um, once again, a second introduction. Slick is working with the Enneagram, working with the Muses, a beautiful brother, and been putting together his own sort of interpretation, reinterpretation. Hey, everybody. And putting, How am I sounding? Uh, You're good. Please do say a few words, brother. Introduce yourself and throw at the table what's on your mind. You haven't had a chance to speak. Can you? Is I uh, can can we hear you, Slick? Okay, it seems like Slick's camera seems to have frozen. Either that or he's sitting in a very still posture. Are you with us, brother? We'll give him a few minutes. I'm sure his system will refresh itself. Welcome, Ronan, dear brother. Let us know when you're going to jump on. Um, harmony to you too and harmony to everybody in the chat. And so, yeah, I think this this fundamental and slick, brother. As soon as you you can speak, let us know. Yeah, um, don't be scared to cut in on me um, if you're hearing. I hope you're hearing. So, yeah, I think that this this fundamental um, light and dark started from very ancient times. I, I mean, I'd, I'd love to put that out to the panel. Like, what do you think? Is the order of events because there of there's history of us being highly advanced, civilized, with technology, with great knowledge, and then I think there's a time before that. What do you guys think? Where does it start? Where does it go? Um, I just kind of wanted to sort of offer sort of my thoughts on kind of like the evolution of like in terms of man sort of evolving into religion and finding God. So. I kind of think of it literally from a kind of a spiritual evolution perspective where you sort of start out, you know, with a universe, which is basically just sort of like, you know, pure information and awareness. Then as it sort of evolves, then it forms energy, then it starts to form different like, you know, physical forms, rocks, planets, et cetera, et cetera, then crystals. And each one of these gradations is a different level of like spiritual awareness. So you start off with like one big awareness and then it kind of uh, demarcates and just like smaller and smaller collectives until you inevitably, inevitably get to organisms. And then you inevitably get it to human beings who are self-aware. And I've been thinking about like some of those questions, like how do we deviate from nature and like what I think a lot of it had to do with, humanity's discovery of the imagination and the astral plane. I think that's really what makes us unique among other organisms is our ability to sort of like manifest all these like places and images and these otherworldly states in our mind. And I think kind of the reason we deviated from nature because we were kind of at a crossroads at that point in our evolution. It's like we can either live in this natural world, this this physical natural reality, or we can live in this ideal realm with uh, with all these gods and spirits and stuff. And so I think what's been happening, you know, and this is this goes with the evolution of like religion is sort of a, a, a it's like humanity is sort of transferring itself to this um, this other more astral realm, but we're not we're doing so in a way where we're not integrating nature. We're not having the we're not seeing these two worlds be connected there's sort of this uh this disparate relationship between the two and the more because if you think about like some of like like christianity for example there's always the talk about like oh you know the world is a wicked place it's run by satan and 
you know, then, because then what happens is then there's this a focus and an orientation towards, you know, heaven, a, you know, a more mystical realm. But I think in overindulging in some of these more mystical realms, we sort of neglect the physical realm around us, if that makes any sense, because we haven't figured out necessarily how to integrate our individual awareness and our imagination and, and do so in a way that's in harmony with nature. And that's really the way I think about what we've been, humanity has been doing for the past 5,000 years is trying to, we have this new tool, this new sensory organ, but we don't, we haven't quite figured out how to use it responsibly yet. And that's why a lot of people use it, or they weaponize it. They use it for, you know, to, to mind control people and to, you know, you know, harm the environment, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, that's, I guess that's why I'm not like as like conspiratorial because just because not because I'm against the ideas of conspiracies or that I don't think that they exist, but it's like, I, can, I guess I can always come up with a kind of an alternative theory as to like the nature of things. I mean, there's definitely like, I mean, well, conspiracy, whatever they are, they're there. I don't know. But I think when you look at it from this point of view of integrating a new type of consciousness, it's like, oh my God, we can see spirits and we can see these uh, extra dimensional realms. It's like this, oh, look at this wonderful platonic realm. Let's go there. Screw, screw the natural world. Let's go there instead. And I think that we kind of... Um, there, there, there's there's an there's an imbalance. See, I guess in my system, there's um, there's really kind of like two. There's like a physical and astral sort of world. I mean, I don't know if astral is the right word, but it's like there's a kind of a, a physical world and mental world. They're both sort of basically mirror reflections of each other. And I think what's happened with religion is that the 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 relationship between the two is more dis more disparate, more distorted, more unbalanced. So. And I think religion, in some sense, is a way, is an attempt to correct that imbalance. But the problem is, that a lot of times, it just makes that imbalance even worse. That's uh, that's my thoughts on the subject. Well, I think you're totally onto something there, because there is definitely a disparity and a, 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 an imbalance running. We've got, we've got our two brothers here. We've got the slick dissident back. And we've got Jeremy as well. And I've introduced the stick dissident, but I'll say a few more words again. Third time lucky. The stick dissident is working with the Enneagram in a very original, authentic way. Basically, he's channeling the Enneagram, re-channeling it, if, if you want to say it in such terms, because essentially what's happening. He's bringing it out into a new context giving it a modern suit so that it can feel at home at the dinner table with us, so to speak. We've got uh, Jeremy here as well. Jeremy is a beautiful brother that's very inspired with nature, shamanism, and he's he's got his drum and his rhythms working for him. He's a father. He's very in tune with his nature and the wilderness and uh, a beautiful brother to bring his insights. He's a storyteller. So, yeah, man, we're here. Slick, brother, this third time lucky. Do please say a word, and it's holding thumbs. All right. How am I coming through now? It looks pretty good. A little garbly, but I can hear you. Oh, should I speak up? When you speak a bit closer, it does seem to be a bit better. Okay. And slower. All right. Uh, I'm doing very nice. Uh, the signal is... Uh, kind of typical for my energetic karmic path. Uh, I've, you know, the more I embrace my Luddite self, the more technology seems to recognize the spirit of my choices. Uh, so yeah, it's mutual. I'll say it that way. Uh, but uh, I wanted to at least convey a definition out of the dictionary for this topic today because I know my signal is going to be a little broken, but I just want to get the bare minimum across if I can. Uh, I want to read the definition of the word influence. The word influence is a fascinating concept. Um, I think that one of our, uh, our most powerful uh, capacities in the realm is the power of association. It's protected in the Constitution. First Amendment gives you the freedom of association 
that is the keystone to sympathetic magics. And uh, Cosmic Prankster, you were saying, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I can sense your caution in what you choose to associate with. I see that you're like defining yourself very carefully with your words. That's awesome. That's totally what we're all in here for. But I, I want to convey the original definition of influence as I believe we are drawn into association through the sympathetic magic that we call influence. And this is also the uh, keystone to uh, working in equity. Uh, but I'll just, I wanna leave, I wanna just read this uh, definition. I hope I'm coming through. Can somebody give me a thumbs up? And Okay, all right, all right, thank you. Uh, this is from uh, 1961 uh, Webster's. And it's a long definition, bear with me. Influence, number one, astral, A-S-T-R-O-L, astral, or origin, an ethereal fluid thought to flow from the stars and to affect the actions of men. Later, a supposed emanation of occult power from stars. Number two, poetic, an emanation or effusion, especially a spiritual or moral force. Number three, the act or power of producing an effect without apparent force or direct authority as influenced by suggestion. Number four, hints, power arising from station, character, wealth, etc. I want to really put a pin in that word station. Uh, because when I do anagrams, I'm rearranging the station of the letters to bring out more information to, that is influencing us in an underhanded way. The word underhanded comes from the word influence. Uh, number four, a person or thing that exerts influence, especially considerable influence. Number six, induction. Uh, synonymous with influence, authority, prestige or weight, credit means power, oh, excuse me, credit mean power exerted over the minds or acts of others. Influence originally implied and still often implies an affection insensibly, but in current use, it often suggests conscious and sometimes underhanded power used in affecting a person or in affecting a result. I love how many qualifiers they put on that sentence. Sometimes, but not often, but nowadays, and then maybe later we might think of it as, yeah, we're, we're getting results out of you fools. I just love all those qualifiers. It's so silly. Uh, authority implies the power. Hey, brother? Yeah. Um, it's very weird. Your voice gets really clear, and then it goes like sounds like you're purring a little bit. Like I don't know if you can downgrade your camera, if you can uh, set the settings to be well. Maybe you can set it to change the bit rate. But uh, let's see if that's better. Please continue because it's fascinating what you're saying. Okay, is that uh, is that helping at all? I think it's not the. I think it might be your orientation of your the angle that you're speaking at because when you're facing the camera, even if you put your camera on, when you're facing it, it seems to work perfectly well. How about that? Is that better? Oh my gosh! What did you do? You you turned uh, into HD sound. It's the power. It's my power cord because I have it charging while I talk. The power cord's getting in the way. Ah, I think that's. I don't know how this stuff works. I made. I made that up. Wow. I just made that up. I don't know if that's what's happening, but that's good to know. I'm coming through better now. Please continue. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just thought that like maybe we could improve the sound so we can really hear you exactly everything you're saying. Very nice. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Yes. Um. So influence originally implied. Okay, hold on one sec. It's very small print. Authority implies the power resident in a person or thing to win devotion or allegiance 
and to gain rather than exact obedience and belief. That sentence is very interesting, to gain rather than exact the belief. Uh, that is so, uh, I think there's a million definitions in that sentence that would lead us on to, yeah, to much learning. Uh, prestige implies power to gain ascendancy over the minds of men for conspicuous excellence in its kind. Weight implies measurable influence, especially in determining the acts of others. Credit, influence that arises from one's reputation for inspiring confidence. Now it goes on to some other things, but I just wanted to share this because influenza comes from this word. And we just had a global shutdown of influencers influencing everybody to believe had influenza. It is a keystone word in the definitions, even in the archaic uh, significance. I think we need to resurrect all of these archaic terms and bring them to the forefront of many conversations uh, so we can speak more impeccably. But I just wanted to bring influence to the table if we're going to be talking about stars, because we still know and uh, conform to the fact that celebrities are the stars. And they're also, um, when you were talking about celebrities earlier, uh, uh, it made me think of, uh, again, with my seashells on the seashore, uh, which is a spell on the minds of man. There are covert seashells hiding all through our lexicon. And again, the shell ebrighty is a bright shell that you might be tempted to pick up and use as currency. Uh, because originally wampum was the money of the of the Americas. And so, yeah, the shell of Brighty is definitely a lure, a bait, uh, something trying to influence you, to draw you in, to determine uh, where you're looking at all. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that. I th I th That's I really we'll beautiful, pretend. brother. We'll Please do pretend that... Uh, Slick was uh, coming through to us from a uh, radio we were dialing in and he was transposing a message from uh, a different realm or time, time ago. And so now he's we're going to have to switch him off for a little while until we get the signal back in and can talk to him more clearly. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, Slick, I, I'm hoping you can hear me. Um, it might be the, the if you put a book under your if you're on your phone, I don't know what device you're on, but maybe if you try putting a book underneath there, a buffer, something that's like a, um, because there's some kind of vibration happening. That's what I'm picking up. I don't think it's necessarily your connection. I don't even think it's your video because your video was coming through clearly and thinking about it, I was wrong because if there was an issue with your connection, your video would be lagging and doing funny things, but your video was coming through clear. The problem is your audio, which is fascinating. So if you've got an audio jack that you can plug in with a, uh, a headphone mic system, that would probably work well. Or maybe if you put like soft books, something that's padded underneath the tripod, it might stop the vibration. It's weird. Um, maybe it's got to do with the metals and the materials around where you've got your device as well. I've noticed this, it affects my mic, what I've got close to me, interestingly enough. One more introduction to be done, not um, last but not least. We've got Jeremy with us. Um, as I was saying before, I did I did mention that Jeremy is a beautifully inspired brother, shamanically inspired, very much in tune with his with his home life, with his family, which is a form of karma yoga, which is powerful. Jeremy, please do say do say some words. Lovely to have you. Thank you for joining us. An honor to have all of you guys here. We've got the Magnificent Seven on the, on the table at the moment. Hey, guys, can you hear me? Thanks for the intro. <clears throat> Always good to be here. Um, let's see, several years ago, I found myself in the deep Adirondacks. Um, probably about late evening. And I was walking down the path uh, to go 
work for a friend of mine. And it was probably about, oh, maybe like 19 degrees in the woods. Pitch black. Very icy path. And at times I would turn the flashlight off, which in in woods like that, in a situation like that, your your flashlight is is simply just this uh, rather small circle of light with zero fall off on either side, and having the light on can actually feel more um, perilous than if you turn it off. And so I would turn it off and immediately the, you know, the cold darkness of that very, very old forest would squeeze in, would, sque would, would squeeze in and then release and then squeeze in and pull your attention upwards towards the river of stars and banked by the pitch black treetops. And eventually at the end of the path, um, there's a beaver dam pond and all the stars reflected in the pond. And it's, it's dead silent. You know, there's, there's no sound. It's like the, the coldness and the blackness just suck the sound out but it's it's great it's actually very it's extremely freeing because you can you can become that formless thing that sometimes you find in deep meditation and the because you can't see into the woods and there's no sound your your focus is is pretty much solely trained on these stars and in the deep dark Adirondacks when the stars come out on a clear night it's uh it's like nothing you've ever seen before and the feeling is of being filled with some sort of electrical charge coming down to you from these stars because of your combination of attention and, and how bright they are. And so I feel like if you want to begin to understand astrotheology, you should make the time every so often to find that place that's deep in the deep in the wilderness you gotta go deep because you, you know you don't want you don't want light pollution and and you know you find find your spot and you know let the stars uh charge you up because it'll last for a while until you forget it again and you need to go back out so it's good to be here and I look forward to the conversation. Lovely to have you here, brother. And there's something in that when you're in the dark, you start to see in a different frequency of light. If you allow yourself to spend enough time in the dark, because our bodies are continually adjusting. The same as like if you pick up a heavy weight and you pick up a heavy weight and you pick and you do it often consistently sooner or later that heavy weight will become second nature to you you'll be able to pick up a heavier weight and the eyes are the same when it comes to the light if you're picking up a heavy weight of light that is outside of your usual range of frequency and you allow yourself to pick it up with practice your eyes will start getting good at picking up that frequency of light and then if you allow your eyes to pick up a heavier weight you know, further a field of the frequency, it will start to adjust to the point where you can see in the darkness. And and um, so there's definitely something to be said about feeling that blanket of soft dark around you 
and the way it sort of envelops the senses and it really brings you back to your ears, doesn't it? And it forces the ears to become so super awake. And with the ears becoming awake, it sort of, to me, it seems like you can feel everything through your ears, like a bat almost. I don't know if that makes sense. You can feel the trees. You can feel the life. You can feel the animals in the distance. You can. The ears are such a powerful tool that we've not. And headphones. Uh, those of you that use headphones, try not to. Um, I mean, those headphones that you plug into your ears, it's, you're looking for trouble, man. If you're going to use headphones, be careful which headphones you use. Make sure that they're the dish ones that go around your ears and actually create an acoustic outside of your inner ear. Because those ones that you stick into your ears, it's going to hurt you, uh, hurt your potential to hear properly, to really hear. So I can't even use earphones. I'm, I'm just too sensitive. When I use headphones, it, it, it really hurts my ears. Like it causes me physical pain. And um, so, yeah. There's definitely something to be said about traveling on your ears, especially in the forest and the wild. So much love, man. What do you guys think as well about um, what's on the table? I feel like uh, it should be acknowledged that a lot of our history is unwritten. And so um, we find ourselves coming into the fossil record around 0.2 million years ago or 200,000 years ago. But our history doesn't start until about 6,000 years ago. And so I would like to assert that it's likely that we lived in a matriarchal antediluvian society uh, for a very long time. And it was matriarchal before the antediluvian technologies um, up to 200,000 years ago. Um, so it's said that language was actually invented by goddesses or women and that men stole it from them. They used it for, for secret diplomatic communication. And oftentimes uh, it said that they would etch it into the dirt or the sand and scratch it away. And so that's why it wasn't used um, in a lasting way that's made it through the ages. But uh, one of the interesting aspects that we see from the matriarchal time is that uh, we look at in death, um, people would go in and through the earth into the underworld and then reemerge from within, come back to the surface. Um, now, uh, our idea of death is that we go up and out from the earth into the heavens and then return back from above. And so those different types of aspects kind of, um, if you look at the anatomy and physiology of the male and female, it's got a male truck driving by, uh, the male and female anatomy of the sexual organs, uh, the female goes in and through the female, the male goes up and out. Um, so with that transformation, sorry about the noise there. Uh, with that transformation of our of our belief systems, uh, we change the idea of where the soul goes in death. And uh, I just wanted to point that out um, that there was a lot of other aspects of the matriarchal times um, that were starkly different than than today. I think during those times it was mentioned that property ownership. Um, Earlier, we mentioned um, in Africa that some people don't have the understanding of property ownership. Um, and I think during the matriarchal times, everything was collective. It was a shared communal experience. Um, then with the, the fall of the matriarchy and the taking over of the patriarchy, um, this, was, this was articulated uh, in the Enuma Elish by the Mesopotamians by suggesting that um, the planet, which used to be the asteroid belt, was re originally referred to as Tiamat, was destroyed um, by Nibiru, the dark sun, which they later uh, referred to as Marduk. And so this articulates the story of Marduk having killed the mother of the goddesses, Tiamat. And um, when she was destroyed, the power uh, shifted now, the gods and the goddesses retreated from here and went back into the inner earth sanctuary during that time at which they exiled Marduk and the fallen legions of Marduk, which is mankind, their slave race. Um, so when, when this transformation happened, we see in Egypt a similar aspect of what happened with Marduk overcoming the, the matriarch. Uh, Amun-Ra, the secret cult of Amun-Ra, 
at that point started to turn the high priestesses of the temple into temple prostitutes and then came up with the invention of gold currency as money. And so during that time, we, we kind of shifted away from the integration of spirituality and science as alchemy and then moved into separating those and moved away into materialism where they're trying to push us in today and push us into that cell of materialism by suggesting that we're only a body and made of parts, kind of like a, like a machine, which is very sad to me. And when people think that artificial intelligence can ar articulate something that resembles the human consciousness, I laugh because the miracle of life and the power of consciousness and the many different dimensional levels that you can access through that consciousness is vast. And the, pub, the public and the mass of the collective don't really see must pass the, the, the things we see with our eyes. They don't really look into that darkness often. And so those of, who, of us who have, we know that there's immense power to be able to see through time and space into higher dimensions of self. Um, and so a computer trying to compare it to that is, is very laughable to me. Although there is, of course, power in technology. And uh, the ancients have always been trying to create some kind of a, a machine that can resemble a person. They called it the automaton back in the Greco-Roman times. But um, yeah, I'm just kind of going on some tangents here. But I want to open the door to some other things we can talk about. If you guys want to go on that, you can. Or anything else is welcome. Yeah, I actually um, was kind of interesting. You, Indy, you mentioned the idea of like, you know, sometimes when we die people believe that we go back into the earth and then there's the other perception where we go to the sky. Well, I was thinking about it like in terms of birth, like instead of death, I've been thinking lately, it's kind of like we come from both at the same time in the sense that it's like, there's the mother sort of earth. That's sort of like, you know, isn't a creation of our being, but we're also, there's also the father sort of sky sort of element and that the self actually comes when the, these two forces inter intermingle with each other. So we're kind of like from both places at the same time. One thing I'm also noticing in the conversation about religion is the sort of the, the gender of God. I've actually been kind of been becoming more of a duo theist lately. And I think that there really is a distinctive um, male and female sort of like God force in the universe that kind of creates the balance of consciousness. And one thing I kind of noticed culturally speaking is that we tend to favor one over the other, where it was like, you know, you, where, for example, you got like the Christian monotheist, where it's like, oh, you know, we got, you know, it's, it's this male God, God is a male and, uh, you know, women, they're like subservient and they got to follow the man. Then you got the more, the other side, you got the more feminist side, you no know, God's a woman, any, any male God is an evil, patriarchal, murderous monster thing. And what I've been kind of thinking lately, it's kind of like if you think of like gods as like our parents, it's like humanity is like we're like the children of divorced parents. Like we have like a mother and a father, God, who can't quite see to eye, eye to eye and they can't get along with each other. We're sort of just stuck in the middle and we got to kind of choose between sort of mother or father. And I think really I think what's I think what's a, a spiritual goal that's you know, I've been working on is like, we got to try to figure out a way to sort of bring these two parental figures like back together in harmony through our own sort of human relationship between like, you know, an as above, so below way between men and women finding more common ground and being able to sort of speak to each other. So, and I think that what I've noticed with religion is that it kind of, it kind of further reinforces that divide because the, we, for some reason in our culture, or just in, in humanity in general, is the idea we always have to believe there's only one God, everything comes from one source. I've been really sort of questioning the, the whole concept of monism lately, the idea that there's all one. I think it's honestly, like, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but I think everything comes from two, and that the it's not so much a matter of, like, you know, there's this one, like the hermetic view is more like there's this sort of this oneness, and then it's sort of subdivided, into these two polarities i come from a different perspective and playing with this idea that these two polarities have always existed simultaneously at the same time and one did not come before the other so i guess there, there's there's the tangent i went on um i'll just lose my train of thought at the end 
But uh, yeah, if anyone wants to jump on that, feel free. Jeremy, brother, you were aching to say something. Yeah, I was thinking about this this concept of uh, matriarchy, and it seems like something that, when it existed, it was it was way deep back, maybe beyond thousands of years, and the the beings that the consciousness was descending into, um, you know, uh, would be totally unrecognizable from, what, you know, because because these bodies are this distillation um, from so many different types of bipedal organisms. And I see the earth as something it you didn't they didn't have to they didn't have to create boundaries on the land and say this is this is this and this is this and that's mine, this is yours. And I have more than you, you know. Um because it was so it was so fecund everything you needed was right there um but these groups you know they still created their communities and had that innate disease deep desire to understand you know what was going on around them and it was probably the stories from above were oral and sung and danced. And maybe it was the, the scratchings in the dirt trying to recreate these rhythms of the chaos that, that started the, you know, the ordering and the differentiation and the boundary setting. And couple something like that with, you know, uh, changes in the geology and maybe cataclysms. And bit by bit, this matriarchy was uh, uh, fractured. And not, it's not good or bad. It's just what happens. And so this, this idea of, of matriarchy, I mean, it's beyond, I think, necessarily what we think of as, as female today. But it's, <clears throat> it's not like it, it, it goes anywhere. Because, you know, we obviously are still talking about it today. Anyways, just some thoughts. I think there's something to that, definitely. Um, and when, when I consider the divine feminine, the feminine principle, I think about feeling. I think about the heart's ability to enter into the emotional field. I call this the astral. I think the women reflect the astral more, and men reflect the etheric more. So the etheric is reflecting the form, the logos, the logic. The astral is reflecting the feeling the love, the devotion, that power that, that, that nurtures and heals, which comes from the heart. And I think that we, we, it was a natural evolution for us to move out of the feeling. In other words, I think we only existed in the astral and we developed the etheric. And then it was like a new organ. That we had to develop and we had to fully develop and master it to realize that it's no good on its own <laughs> so we've we've come from the astral when we were already in that feeling zone and then we thought like oh well there's this new organ let's develop it so we developed this new line of evolution and now that we've developed this new line of evolution we're sort of 
moving towards the homogeny, the balance between the two. Now, I think we're moving towards getting towards being able to utilize both because both are developed. And we've sort of lost sight of the feeling principle because of, and, and this is something that we're going to probably going to have to beat on down in this discussion. Let's not pretend that any of this is natural. Let's not pretend that there weren't dark brotherhoods and sisterhoods manipulating humanity. Somebody mentioned it earlier about, you know, being able to predict a, um, a eclipse and using that power to sway the masses into a religious doctrine, right? Look at me. I've got all these godly powers. I can tell you what the sky, I can make the sky turn black. Bam, watch. People could have abused that knowledge and probably likely, and I'm sure they did. They wanted to become godlike. So I think there's been a lot of abuse and harassment of humanity by those with knowledge and power. And let's not pretend that it's in the past. I think it's just become so well adapted that we've just learned to live with it. And it's a major part of what's going on. I mean, we, we've had so many conversations about the media, the indoctrination of children in schools, the financial money system, the ploy of employment that we all get pushed into, falling for this ploy, um, the slave wage slavery, like the idea that you need money to live on earth. Well, then why weren't we born with a bag of money? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, where's money? So you don't see cows being born with a bag of money uh, so that they can live on earth. So there's, there are a lot of crazy ideas that we've just become so accustomed to that we assume that it's just normal that we need to live in this way. But let's, let's also consider how much of that is institutionalized. Racism, for example. It's a classic example of how they've played the light against the dark. They've demonized the female. And by demonizing the female, they've demonized the dark, right? Because I see the female as being the dark, deep silence of the heart. Dark because it's not so obvious. Dark because emotions aren't so clearly definable. They're deep and they run through you. You can feel them. They empower you. They hit you hard. But you can't put your finger on it and define it the way you can thoughts. Thoughts seem to be so light and you can clearly see each thought distinct from another thought and evaluate each thought specifically and get a very clear idea of that thought. But when it comes to emotions, they overlap. There's a depth and a darkness to them that transcends, like going into the deepest parts of the ocean. You're diving into a deep, 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 deep well, and you don't know how deep this well goes, but you can feel it, the impact of it. So this dark has been demonized, and with the dark depth of the divine feminine being demonized, the 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 people with dark skins have been demonized by society. And I mean, just look at what's been going on on Earth. We can't pretend that there's not a racist agenda running. I mean, critical race theory sort of sums it up for us, right? <laughs> it's, it's all in the syntax so and it's 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 not really a laughing matter but we've got to laugh so that we don't lose our minds um and here in south africa for example it's being used to polarize and to create dissidents like the white people are being made of here in south africa and the non-white people are being told that they need to become militarized and so they there's different factions of politics trying to sort of load the one and play the one against the other and the other against that one instead of like the recognition. Am I coming through clearly or am I breaking up, by the way? Sounds like Good. you're breaking up a bit. Did I? Interesting. So, yes, there's definitely this this divisive polarization that's being used in order to manipulate us and it's not not new so the, the the question of why the divine feminine is being repressed why it's being demonized what is this fear because in our regaining the divine feminine emotional field of compassion and empathy and love we become empowered and when we become empowered 
we cannot be controlled. And so religion, we've got to look at this, has a lot to do with control. I'll, I'll leave that on the table for you guys to chunk at the bit. Well, I, I wonder if also, you know, maybe a lot of that isn't fully conscious, it's subconscious. And it's also the result of people acting and behaving in a certain way over a long span of time. And so it's almost like their ancestral DNA is acting out on some of these things. And so you think of the feminine energy as the as the dark, it's covert and it's covert because that's how it needs to interact in the world in order to survive versus like a man can act more consciously and state his direction and everything because he is more built and uh, able to to combat uh, another person's force and will directly through physical content contact and competition where a fem the feminine forces need to be covert and act and move kind of more in the the shadows and um otherwise she would be kind of taken advantage of and, and so i think also going back to you know the the race thing well people for many you could think of people for thousands of years thinking of the the darkness of night as bringing you know certain creatures of the night that don't exist during the day you think of all the nocturnal creatures that might be coming out and snatching people and so their pattern of their subconscious behavior of this collective group has has been trained to associate darkness with a certain emotional response and they're not going to consciously be able just to flip the switch and so maybe by seeing a dark or a light person they associate things uh, unconsciously just because i feel like so many people um, act through more of their subconscious and unconscious actions and they're not even consciously uh, aware of it and we saw that when we saw the uh, agenda from a few years ago and I think what we're seeing is kind of a whole new battleground of influence going back to what Gabriel was saying. What is the reality of this influence? And we're still fighting this battle between these visible and unvisible, um, invisible forces of influence that are acting upon us. And back in the day, we we saw those as, you know, the nocturnal creatures of of the night. And we had more direct consequences for not taking action to plant our harvest or protect ourselves at night or protect ourselves from these storms that have devastating consequences um, and the powers of, of the cosmos. And so I think we're still, you know, right now just in this battle and people are have their ideals of, oh, I, this is how I can act out and protect the community. And somebody else has a conflicting idea and said, no, this is how I think we should be protected from these visible and invisible forces. And then they they're clashing and trying to compete for, for, for power. You know, um, Bush whisperer, I think I have figured out an answer to your question in regards to why the divine feminine is sort of suppressed and we're sort of more patriarchal masculine. If you really think about every cult or every, any kind of dogmatic system, the one thing, the one element that is always like, basically acid or kryptonite is mystery true genuine unknown mystery if you think about like every like religious belief system even atheism is guilty of this where they always try to eliminate the mystery i'm going to figure out all the answers i know ultimate reality and that's what a lot of religion does is it basically says we understand everything we have all the answers figured out so you don't have to think anymore and mystery is a problem to that because it thinks, well, hey, you know, maybe there's something outside of this. Maybe there's something beyond th this belief system. Maybe there's other forces out there. And religion doesn't want you to know that because it, it's a lot of its fear. It's like you, you there's, there's certain people in this world that either you either love mystery or you hate it. And I think people who are really deep into the religion game, they're really into the deep fundamentalist game. They hate mystery because they like like no i have everything figured out i have all the answers and because the idea that there's mystery in the world is terrifying to them so i think in some sense like the reason the divine feminine is suppressed is because there is you know an element of it that is terrifying like even at like the most basic level you think about like you know being like a young like teenage boy and you you want to go ask a you know a cute girl that you like out on a date there's a lot of real terror that comes in from you 
you know, you meet a girl for the first time, especially if you're unexperienced, there's that mystery, there's that unknown aspect to them. And we're kind of like trying to shy that away because like I said, you know, earlier, the idea that we've kind of evolved our intellect and our imagination, a lot of humans like to think that, you know, because we have this power of intellect that we can figure out anything, we can know anything and we've lacked a sort of a more humble, a connection to the mystery, a kind of humility and an understanding that we're not going to know everything and we never will. I don't even think we're going to know everything even in death. I think that mystery is a sort of a fundamental aspect of existence, like consciousness or love. It's like mystery is inescapable. And I guess if you think about what religion is, it's, it's an escape from mystery into a kind of an insular bubble where you think that one little bubble is the entire universe and nothing exists outside of it. And so I think that what we got to do is we got to burst through some bubbles. I think that's so uh, true. Bubble bursting is where we're at because we're all living in bubbles in a sense. Speaking of bubbles, um, Pat has put up a question. I, I, where is Pat? Are you going to join us, Pat? <laughs> But he's, he's asked us a great question. Do we live in a scripted reality then? And I think that's sort of where we're getting to, like on the edge of that question. Um, how scripted is reality? And what does that mean? Or, or get this, maybe, maybe religion is the script. Think about it. Because it's like when you're on a religion, every religion is essentially a story. And then when you go into a religion, you become part of that story, part of that script, scripture, script and scripture. See, now I'm doing, see, now I'm doing the Bush whisperer thing where I come up with word association. So, yeah. Well, the second part of his question, here. he's relating it to the archaics material. So are you familiar with the archaics material? Because it's based off a of simulation theory. And he's also alluding to, we're talking about religion based on astrological phenomena. And so the, Archaics materials based on with, continuous uh, cataclysm. I'm not, I'm not familiar. So if you guys could enlighten me on what that is, if you'd be interested. Well, th that that is quite interesting. Um, because I think they they both can go together from my perspective. Okay, so the, the, the idea that we're living in a matrix and that reality is a holographic um representation a controlled reality like a control system right an experiment of sorts if, if we want to consider it in such a way but perhaps religion is the experiment perhaps we're living in a feedback loop of consciousness and the feedback loop of consciousness produces this holographic scripted reality and perhaps we do script the reality through our experience. Perhaps we are the co-creators of this reality and what scripts we've got running through our head could well have impact on the nature of reality. Why should the nature of reality not be a reflection of ourselves? I don't know. I'll put that out there. And and um, Aaron, if you want to go into this uh, um archaics work i haven't really delved into it too deeply but from my perspective it's basically that we're living in this matrix and that the matrix is basically it's sort of from what i can see it seems to be borrowing some particular opinionated ideas of interpretations of gnostic cosmology but please do enlighten us um i guess my my brief summary of it because I, I was involved in it for a little while and I went to one of their events when I was living in, in Texas and uh, I was one of the mods on their Telegram group for a little while. But basically their idea is that everything is a simulation theory and that based on using isometric projections and mathematics, you can predict um, one event to another event based on using pi and phi in order to demonstrate that there is this simulation type programming aspect to reality and different aspects of the past continue to reflect into our present and the future, which allows us to be able to predict these patterns of the events. And then the added layer onto that is that um, we live in a simulated reality. And so we're these spiritual beings that are kind of, it's almost like trying to, I think, allude to the aspect that we're kind of in this astral and spiritual realm playing a game in the etheric realm. And, and 
<clears throat> but it, it oversimplifies it, I think, by just dealing with, oh, it's just all a simulation, which I don't necessarily agree with, but also recognizing that there's these historic cataclysmic type cycles that maybe people with knowledge or secret societies are capitalizing on this knowledge and harnessing it in order to move the masses and be able to protect the people, the religious, you know, type leaders who have this, are privy to this knowledge and they go underground and they're able to wait out these cataclysms, harness old technology and then slowly release it on the surface and continuing to kind of enslave the, the masses of, of humanity going through these cataclysmic cycles. And I thought it was really interesting, especially as like a imagination type exercise, but I felt like people got a little too attached to the fantasy aspect of it and really left out what I feel is really like we're talking about the three worlds of the, the shaman and, and leaving out the, the experience of the, the mystic and being able to see what happens when we have this divine and spiritual connection and how that really is the connection that allows me to be able to see these reflections between different events or connect with people in the past or the or the present and the future and that's really a more magical thing for me than necessarily just thinking it's all programmed code yeah that's very interesting um sorry was that dr k yeah, I would like to add on to what Aaron was saying about um, the archaics material. Um, the, one of the issues, you run into the same issue you run into with religion. You have one, uh, one aspect being um, exemplified and you have another being completely removed and not talked about. So do we live in a scripted reality? Yes. What they won't tell you is that you are the author, right? If you don't understand that you are the author of all that you see, you have no choice but to give your power over to it. It's called fighting ignorance. Either you gather light or you give it away. The whole idea of some Illuminati somewhere, they take your light the true light and bend it to make it reflect as if it's coming from them. So these people who you cannot see because you're blinded by the light, but it's yours. So scripted reality is a very real thing, but it, it like anything else, it has as much power as you choose to give it. And you have to understand cosmic made a really good point earlier talking about fear and religion. The problem with fear is when you have ignorance, and you have no knowledge of something, your mind will create a million things to represent and try to understand what it is that has you afraid. And that that enzyme, that chemical has been plagued off of for decades, and it will continue to as long as people choose to remain ignorant. That is so beautifully said, brother. Hats off. I love it, um, and then that's uh, that's that's largely the way I, I feel as well. We've got a, a, a new addition to our discussion, dear Soraya, the poetess, the philosopher, the cosmologist in her own right. She is very much an expression of the divine feminine of the hearts, the feeling, and the love. Though also very rational, down to earth, a thinker. Her poetry is beautiful, touches the heart. If you haven't seen it, go and check it out. It's Infinite Words of Love on Telegram. It, li it literally is what it says. It's like what it says it is on the label. That's what it is. It's this, there's no hidden dimension. It's just infinite words of love. And it touches your heart and it inspires and, and uh, brings people to a beautiful place. So if you're ever having a, a sad day or a moment where you feel like oh, life just isn't working, go and check out Soraya's poetry. Welcome, dear Soraya. I hope you're with us. I hope you can hear us. It's an honor to have you here, honor to have you here with everybody else. Do you please say a few words, if you can, right now? Hi, I'm there. Thank you for the love. Dear Soraya, <laughs> please continue. I said thank you for the lovely, for, for the lovely uh, introduction. Only a pleasure. Dear Soraya doesn't say too much. 
but what she says resonates of the heart. You can feel it. It's got like a deep well of sound. Is there anything you'd like to add, dear? Um, at this moment, this world of stimulation. Of I've just come in. <laughs> well, the, the question on the table is, are we living in a simulation? Is this world a matrix simulation? Is it, um, you know, how much of it is coming from within us? How much of it is constructed by spiritual beings outside of ourselves? I think it's 50-50, honestly. I think that uh, this is this is a matrix, but also not, because there are good parts and bad parts. Absolutely, I love that fifty-fifty. I think that's pretty much where it ends up. That's uh, I think it's pretty much where what what um, we all seeming to like shoot towards the emanation. And there's one thing I want to respond to. Um, after like saying, yeah, I think um, from my feeling, um, Dr. K really dropped a hammer on it nicely. Um, you, you mentioned, Aaron, about your feeling that the shamanic thing has been a little bit left out in the cold with the simulation theory. And I think that's just because the people that are touting the simulation theory have read about it. Because they've read about it, um, the color red, there's not enough blue in it right <laughs> there's no breath nothing no one blew life into the philosophy <laughs> it's just it's just red and they're seeing red and they're running after the red and they need to look at the blue a little bit more the sky and but i think that i don't think they're mutually exclusive this simulation theory and i'll tell you why i don't think they're mutually mutually exclusive because um the whole thing about the nuances of shamanic devotion and practice is about attuning to the rhythm. And the rhythm is patterns that repeat themselves. And so by getting tuned in to the rhythms of patterns that repeat themselves, we can start to notice the patterns of rhythms around those patterns of rhythms and become more in tune with the bigger patterns of rhythm. And so actually become attuned to those beings that are constructing the reality. Though from a deeper shamanic um, revelation, I would say that those beings are reflections of what is within us. That if we go out into the universe and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and we go out into the fractal universe and it just keeps getting bigger, infinitely bigger, 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 it will get to the point where we're coming out of a DNA inside our bodies. I hope that makes sense. Think of a toric field. So those big, huge cosmic forces are also the tiny little forces that are manipulating our DNA resonant fields of vibration, causing those things to spin in particular patterns. And that the spinning of our DNA fields are like the spinning of galaxies and stars. That's how I think of it. So I think that the chain of life that I'm often talking about in, in my um, Bush Whisperer series is, is these beings. And that the guides are different aspects of these beings that one can connect with, different beings that one can channel. And um, that these beings are very much constructing this matrix. As the simulation theory people, I, I say, I, I feel that's right. Though at the same time, I also agree with Dr. K that these beings are also within us. And so the microcosm and the macrocosm truly are reflections of each other. So when we go down into our deepest, smallest parts within us, we are really connecting with those huge, massive cosmic forces that are keeping the universe in check. I hope that makes sense. Don't know. What, what do you think? It makes, uh, it makes pretty pretty sense. sense. You know, I kind of wanted to um, touch something about the whole simulation theory thing. And I can't help but sort of notice there's a sort of a deification of technology happening here. So I think about like we're the reason you know the simulation theory is so popular is because you know we're in a world where we have computers, video games, virtual reality, movies like The Matrix making us think about things in terms of computer simulations. But if you go back about 400, 500 years and you look at the uh, the the phenomenon of deism, which I think was like in the, a lot of uh, the Western culture at the time. This was a time when, um, you know, basic machines were starting to be created, you know, gears and cogs and sort of like, you know, things that were mechan mechanical. 
And back then, the deists kind of viewed and modeled reality as being sort of like clockwork, as mechanical. That's what deism essentially is, the idea that uh, that God created the universe, but he just kind of like, he just sort of wound up a clock and walked into the other room and just kind of like, you know, abandoned the picture. But I was just, I kind of wanted to point that out because the whole thing about the simulation theory is that it's kind of a reflection of the techno technological sort of narrative we're living in right now, I guess the technological script, if you will. That's why, you know, we don't really believe so much in uh, like elemental spirits or angels. And there's more of an emphasis on UFOs because it's like we've taken that sort of, uh, it's like we're channeling that these beings through sort of different lenses. So when we channel the, these beings through a spiritual lens, we might see angels. But if we do it through a more of a techno technological lens where everything is sort of technological and not spiritual, then there are aliens, you know, floating around in flying saucers. So I don't know if I necessarily believe that, but that's just a sort of a thought that just popped into my head just now. This idea of the, um, that a lot of our models of reality are sort of filtered through sort of technological things that we're sort of enamored by that whatever our highest piece of technology is must be like the closest thing to ultimate reality that's not i mean i'm not saying that's what i believe you know i don't necessarily i'm more of a believer in just the power of raw nature but that seems to be kind of like humanity has this kind of idea that whatever is the highest form of technology is sort of the closest representation of the divine it's also kind of why we're so people are so obsessed with artificial intelligence these days because in a way it's almost like it's like sort of like a, a replacement because people don't believe in talking to spirits or angels we live in a mostly at least in the west i can't speak for the rest of the world but certainly in like western europe and the united states there's a very um sort of we're, we're very secular so in a way artificial intelligence is like a new form of sort of like channeling it's like is that same impulse of spirits, but now they're being sort of filtered through this new technological medium uh, via artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's like the creation of uh, a new religion. It's the foundationary kind of work that's going on. And there is the huge attachment to the technological aspect, which is reflective of larger agendas that we see kind of forming. And then also the focus on like the cataclysm or even like nuclear type scares or these large kind of mass trauma events, they, they all seem to share that similar pattern. And so it also makes people put aside kind of morality and a connection to nature and just like, well, everything's going to end. So I might as well just do whatever. It doesn't really matter. And they kind of, it tack makes it really tacky and they get sucked right back into like only this etheric type operation from my perspective rather than them creating the harmony and the resonance with nature and more of a astral and divine type aspect which i think would allow them to better connect with the the guides and the influence environment that would um, steer them away from that kind of direction and and so yeah i definitely agree with a lot of your points and there's so many of the celebrities and spiritual type um, celebrities that are pushing that matrix type element and they're widely promoted well it's that's not that's not by chance you know they're they're making it tacky to suck people into an etheric to cultivate and stir a whole new type of religious pot that can then be used to control uh people and that would lead right back into our discussion on religion and how that environment is kind of cultivated and and steered to further an agenda for long periods of time if I could speak to that, um, to a large degree, um, technology is the, the one world religion. And it is only such because of the ignorance of self, right? The further we actually look back in time, the more sophisticated what, we actu what, what technology actually is becomes, and the more confounded we are by what we see. You know, people still can't uh, understand how pyramids are built, right? We still can't understand why so many of these structures are in desert areas. Like we don't understand that you only get sand when you cut down a large, massive tree, right? 
um, if you look at deserts, you know, the majority, 85 percent of deserts under the in the in the realm have um, fossilized trees underneath them. No one asks why, because that fact isn't propagated. Right. So Antiquitech is a very real thing. The temple of on the temple of Luxor, the, the temple of uh, Waset is a literal layout of not just the body of man, but of, a, of what, what we now call a motherboard. When we look at cities, right, especially the, the these larger megacities, New York, Tokyo, uh, Paris, um, specifically Paris, Egypt, and D.C., which have the exact same uh, topographical layout, right? This idea of laser printing you get from Kailash Temple and the um, Anchor Wat, right? Like, Proper technology has has been misrepresented because they give you this idea of this fake Gregorian calendar, which is a slap in the face of, of the feminine, which is where we learn how to count in the first place properly. Right. We don't have a true time matrix because we're adhering to someone else's. So now because they give you an iPhone 22 and an iPhone 23 and a new iteration every year, you think you're evolving. We can look through, through the cameras and they get better every year. We can look at the functionality and the more interplay we have with apps and the things that we're able to quote unquote do, but it's just a mimicry of what you do. We didn't need phones, we had telepathy, right? So the whole idea of a phone is a slap in the face of who you actually are, but it is so convenient. You know, I would like to believe everybody has a moment in their life where you've thought about somebody and then saw them or they called you. That's a very rare occurrence, but that's the common place of where we actually come from. Did I just hear a mic drop? I think I heard a mic drop. Either that or there's something malfunctioning. No, we're all still here. We're all good. That's beautifully put, dear dear Dr. K. Beautifully, beautifully expressed. Sentiments are on point. Um, I think there's definitely a lot to 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 sort of backstep a little bit. There's a lot to be said about the scripting of reality. Um, and maybe some of these beings want to re-script reality. And because some of these beings want to re-script reality, possibly a lot of religions have come into being the way they are. Something to consider. Because I believe that these patterns are what they are. Like the patterns of the sun are the patterns of the sun. The patterns of the moon are the patterns of the moon. The patterns of night and day are the patterns of night and day. They are what they are. The what we make of them and how we choose to turn them into the world we live in is completely our choice. So I think the, the nature of reality is a very subjective experience. We like to think of it as objective, but I believe it's mostly subjective. And that the subjectivity of our experience of reality gives an impression of objectivity down the line. I hope that makes sense the way I'm saying that. So how what we take from reality on the inner emotional plane is what we give back to reality to construct it. So how we are inspired by the emotions that come from our heart are what we're going to bring into this world. But the thoughts that we've been thinking about how we feel are going to change the way in which we drive the emotional wheel in the future, which is going to keep the loop turning. And I think that there is there is definitely these, these loops in time. There's no doubt about that. Oh, look. Hello. Ah. Look at her, wide awake and very bushy-tailed and beautiful. God bless you. 
say, yeah, I mean, we definitely are are following um, particular patterns. I think we can't avoid following the patterns. This is when, when I look when I go when I was in Wales, I kept seeing in the trees these Celtic patterns, and all those Celtic patterns kept telling me about this what we're talking about yeah if you look at the trees you see there's these little patterns in the trees and if you look really closely you'll see there's like they make like celtic patterns in 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 the trees if you look carefully at least that's the way that the consciousness wants to interpret it and as you like fall deeper into those patterns you notice that the patterns are like swaying out concentrically and so that's i believe these patterns that the celts were drawing were these um cycles of reality that are part of the matrix though what we construct within those cycles is our choice sort of like the sun will shine tomorrow and you'll get a work day tomorrow and then the night will come and you won't work so your work will be controlled by the weather and the days and the nights but you're going to be able to choose where you put the blocks during the daylight hours and where you put the blocks during the daylight hours are going to affect how your night hours go. I hope that's a good analogy, but that's how I sort of look at this idea um, and sort of bringing it back to what Dr. K was saying, that it's we personal responsibility is absolutely fundamental to recognition of the spiritual reality, I believe, and to becoming attuned um, and awakening as in the opposite of ignorance. And... We do look for explanations outside of ourselves. We do look to give somebody else the credit or the blame. I think maybe it's a natural impulse in us because we don't want to have to always take responsibility for what we're doing with our consciousness. And how we use our thoughts are going to construct how the patterns manifest, if that makes sense. You know, I've been, um, you're, I know, you, Bush, you were speaking about, um, you know, reality being objective or subjective. I've been experimenting with this idea of the, the flexibility of truth. See, I, I noticed that when we think about truth in a culture, we have a very rigid sort of like, you know, very rigid conception of truth. That like, it has to be this. I think that truth can be sort of stretched and there's a flexibility to it. Like, it, it, in the sense that, you know, I, like in the, the idea of creating reality, I think we do create reality, but I think we sort of co-create reality with Mother Earth, if that kind of makes sense. It's like, oh, it's like, oh, you made this, uh, you know, really cool, you you want to manifest this garden and, and God's sort of like, okay, you can have that. But there's a certain like, so there's a certain flexibility to reality in that it sort of allows us to it doesn't force us to believe in something. If we want to believe that there is no God, if you want to believe there is a God, reality gives space for all beings to sort of have that space. I think the problem then starts to come when we try to stretch things too far and they're sort of break. Like, I don't know if anybody here, I guess people probably would remember like the stretch Armstrong doll where you could take this, like this sort of this man and you could stretch out his arms and legs really far and, you know, I think truth is kind of like that. It's not like this solid rock, you know. I think that, I guess, if you think of it in terms of religions, if you think of something like, um, I, 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 I can't, you know, I know Sarai is a Christian, you know, in the chat, but I would say probably, relativistically speaking, I would say that monotheistic religions are probably not as flexible as you say, like a Hinduism or a Buddhism, where it's like, you know, one religion is kind of like, you know, oh, there's, you know, other religions are real. This contradicts my belief system. But then some religions are like, oh, this doesn't contradict my belief system. This is actually part of my belief system. So I think that um, when it comes to reality being objective or subjective, I actually haven't really kind of found a consensus for that because I can see kind of like both of those types of uh, experiences existing within reality. Uh, the way I kind of figure it out is um, I'm going to have to explain some of my system here is the idea of uh, uh, the, the concept of a Zarfex. This is something that the Fae have taught me. And it's kind of fundamental to the idea. So if you think about each person basically has their is their own universe. 
every like even when we talk to each other it's like i have my universe bush whisper has the universe kalel indy you guys all have your own universe but all of those universes are connected by what's known as the zarfex so it's like everything that we believe so think about like each of us is exist our universe is like is being part of this massive venn diagram uh the parts where we disagree with our worldviews kind of like are the edges of the circles but where all the our belief systems agree and there's a camaraderie that's where all of our circles intersect and that's sort of like the center of the universe so if i think of see but that's the thing though i don't know if i can call that sort of nexus of overlapping beliefs as objective or not or just collectively subjective so i haven't really kind of like figured out how to parse that i think it's kind of like the way i'm figuring out it's like maybe a mixture of both where it's like if you think of the zarfax as being sort of subjective on the outer layer think of the zarfax as like a big sphere and every one of us is like a little like like a little dot or a cell in this larger sort of body and that on the outer edges of the sphere everything is subjective and there's all these different religions and belief systems but at the very core of the sphere there's more there's more something that would be analogous to objectivity but yet again i don't know if that's tr if i can truly classify that as objective or just a a sub or a, just a massive amount of collective subjectivity that might as well be objective because of its influence and its psychic sort of power of you know billions and billions of minds all kind of intersecting to create a singular kind of dream world so yeah the, the whole objective subjective thing that's a it's an interesting thing and i i used to kind of think you know it was all subjective but i kind of like do, you know due to different experiences in life had to kind of revise that because i didn't really feel like it it fully matched like what i was perceiving so you know and that's the thing about uh, different belief systems you know if you i don't know if anybody like you know really tries to play well I, this is something that people do in chaos magic where they kind of put themselves in different head mindsets like belief systems like i'll try to be a christian for a day i'll try to be an atheist for a day I'll try to be a Buddha for a day, or I'll try to be a, a Wiccan for a day. And what's really interesting, and this is another thing I've noticed, and this kind of relates more to actual, you know, psychic and magic stuff, is that when you take on a different belief system, it's not just that you intellectually and sort of like thematically frame the world around you. I believe that the nature of psychic energy, since we all live in different universes, depending on what belief system you, you base in, that psychic energy fluctuation changes so for example if you genuinely believe that there is no god and that there is no purpose in life you know the universe will generate less synchronicities whereas if you're somebody who you know does believe you know in the in, in some kind of survivor then you'll get then you'll get tons of synchronicities be like oh my god magic is actually real and the way i see it is that there's a sort of space where it's like there's different dimensional spaces we can access and depending upon what belief system you're in you're in that sort of dimensional sector and um so i guess to kind of like you know just go back to the whole idea of like you know objective and subjective it's kind of like it's i don't know maybe it's more of a gradient where it's not just like you know wholly subjective and wholly objective maybe there's a lot of like sort of like in between room between those two variants you know that there's something that's like partially objective partially subjective so it be subjective or ob sub job like some something in the middle that's not subjective or objective or maybe something that's beyond you know those parameters so i don't know it's give me a lot to think about i would like to add to what you've said in a short and sweet idea I like to consider the circumference as being nowhere and the center as being everywhere and use that as a cone. And so the objective reality, right, the circumference is moving towards the center, nowhere. And the center is expressing itself everywhere. The subjective is what we're experiencing, and the objective is what we're turning the experience into in terms of our alignments with it 
which is what you're talking about, how we can change our slant of perspective and experience by changing ideas in our minds. Um, look at her. She's so cute, eh? She's got a, is that a lightsaber? That's a lightsaber, eh? The force is strong in this one. Yeah, man. Um, she's so so wide awake. Okay, hey? you look look at so there, there's a classic example. Like you, you look at a child that's young, like that cherry age before the learning has like robbed <laughs> robbed us of our of our naturalness of being um you know just experiencing reality and we get an idea of just how subjective reality is but we've like we like to consider the subjectivity of reality as an objective reality and i think they are both the same thing i think it's just a different way of interpreting it and it's like the masculine and the feminine you know the masculine is objective the feminine is subjective but the masculine is actually embedded within the feminine right the way children are born right so the phallic expression is actually going towards the center nowhere that circumference is actually going nowhere and that center is actually being expressed everywhere it surrounds the phallus and surrounds it and encompasses it. So I think that you cannot have reality without this. You cannot have a baby without a daddy and a mommy. And they got to get jiggy jiggy with each other. Something's got to go in somewhere in order for something to come out of that. So it's the same idea, I think, the expression that, you know, we've got this dynamic polarity there's no escaping it but i think they are both so embedded within each other that they're not actually separate it is just our perspective that separates a unity into a duality so i gotta go soon but it's very interesting that you brought up just what you brought up because i was writing down on my notes where does your penis actually go when it enters the vagina? Like we're not just, right? We're not just our physical bodies. We're all these other bodies. Well, the, the penis goes into darkness, right? It's something interesting. Google penetrating the stars. Just Google it and and, and scroll and, and, and see, read the, the titles uh that you find there um i like what you said bush whisperer about the feminine aspect of darkness like where do you where do you really go where can you go when you're having sex with a woman when your eyes are closed and I brought this image of um, like a like a beautiful forest or some sort of beautiful vista, right? And you look at it, and there's a dark point somewhere in there, and it's a cave surrounded by by all this beauty. And does the does the darkness encourage you to explore it? And it seems as though the the conquering of the fear of darkness. The the feminine rewards it with this like endless well of source and energy. And when when you go into the darkness, especially out in nature, you alone you are contending with the earth. And you are contending with this inner sight of yours projecting outwards. Hey. <laughs> and this projection, I think, is uh, is like this matrix. This this matrix is a 
uh, a false wall of uh, projection from within coming out. And so I really like what um, Medea said about the 50-50 the aspect to the matrix and reality. So with that, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take off. And it was good to be here. I'm probably not going to be on later because uh, it's actually my 10th anniversary with Lauren. So we're going to go celebrate. Wow. Well, Congratulations. Happy, happy anniversary to both yourself and Laura. I hope she's having a great time. I hope she's good. I hope she's happy. I hope, she's you, I hope you're going to treat her, treat her to something special. So, and you guys are going to have a good, good time. And wow. And your little one, yep. she's looking so lovely. So God bless you. God bless Laura. God bless your little beautiful little star next to you. She really is like a glowing star. Hey? Look at that little face. Yep. Sending you big love to all of you. May your family prosper and have an absolutely wonderful, auspicious day. Thanks, guys. Talk to See you, you soon. Jeremy. Happy anniversary. Um, Happy anniversary, Jeremy. Peace. Bye. See you later. Yeah, I just wanted to mention something on the 50-50 the uh, aspect that you guys are talking about. If we look at Judaism and its roots, um, it said that Judaism is not a monotheism, but a henotheism. And it has a, um, a polytheistic pantheon of gods from which one was chosen to worship, that being Yahweh. But there were other gods that were celebrated, and there's a list of about 12 of them. El Shaddai being the most high on the list, I believe, although others suggest it's another one. But El Shaddai had a wife named Asherat, who was the wife of God. And uh, as things changed with Judaism and it usurped different beliefs of other pagan worshipers into its doctrines, it kind of transformed through time. And uh, I feel like in its in its development in the Roman period, it kind of adopted the the Oriental Mystery School sun god aspect of like Mithras and such. And so uh, we still see it as a representation of the Heavenly Father, although we know that it, they worship the moon and Saturn. And they have a moon calendar, the Metonic calendar with uh, seven um, embolismic years of 13 months, 13 representing the sacred feminine of the 13 moon cycles. And the correlation with the uh, morning star of Venus. And um, we see that Friday the 13th, Friday represents Freya or Venus. So it's the day of the goddess. And there's only one day besides the moon uh, in which a goddess is represented by as a planet uh, or, an, or a celestial body. We have the sun and the moon being two of those celestial bodies and the rest being planets. But uh, the only planet that's represented as a goddess is, is Venus or Freya or Friday. So when we see that Friday the 13th, it's representation of the old lost matriarchy. Um, it's said that during the matriarchal times, um, before the time of integration, like El Shaddai and Asherat were both sharing the power together, uh, that the, the males were not actually gods. They were consorts and servants of the goddesses. And so when we look at these other figures that have been demonized now, like um, Enki and Thoth and um, Hermes and um, the green emperor of China, Fusi, um, Enoch, integral figures in, in the, the protection of humanity against the um, what they called at the time the snake people or the giants. Um, those figures were represented as a, as a sacred union, them and their, and their wife, especially uh, Fusi and Nuwa. And originally the story was said that the females were the creators of all of mankind and, and, the, and governors of, of all of existence in nature and such. 
And then later on, um, it was it was switched, and they said that the males were the ones that were the creators, and the males were the ones that created everything. But when we look at the story of uh, the Green Emperor of China, it said that the New Wa actually created the people from mud. And then um, they were kind of running wild as savages and she became their mother and like helped them learn how to how to live. And uh, he, he came up with little inventions along the way, like the fishing net and the, the snare for animals or something like that. But she did all the work. But um, but ultimately, it was really like um, the male did have a prominent role as a servant and he did a lot of things. Um, but she was kind of given the the credit for it a lot of times and i feel like that's how mammals and how humankind works best as we mentioned earlier um using only objectivity and only um the masculine analytical mindset to be able to control the world around us has been found to be no it does not it's not effective but as an integration together with the two aspects things work better and if the if the male aspect comes subsequent to the female aspect, compassion and love are the uniting factor and the guiding factor there. When the masculine leads the feminine, I think money is the guiding aspect in sex. So that's not necessarily, it's gratification and greed. So I, that might be a demonization of the masculine, but I feel like there's an aspect of, of maternal instincts to the feminine that makes it inherently more compassionate than the male. Although it's not absolute, you have exceptions. There's going to be females that don't seem to have that maternal instinct or compassion that can adopt the, the masculine cutthroat competitive aspect. And we see that sometimes um, with, with certain individuals in politics, for example, I won't mention any names, but I think I know y'all know who I'm talking about. That's very interesting. Um, cause when I, when I think of, um, just to draw a distinction, I think of empathy and I think of compassion and I think of logos of logic. So empathy I see as being the, the feminine. That's like when you can empathize, you can feel into another human being's feelings and take it on board. And the logos is when you can logically correlate and put it into perspective. And then I think of what compassion means. And like the passions are the expressions of the emotions. And the passions drive us towards actions, expressing certain notions physically and through our words and deeds. And when I think of what compassion means, to me, it's like the combination between the masculine and the feminine. Because the feminine is empathic. But empathy is not compassion. Empathy is what's required in order to find compassion. But the logic has got to be applied to the empathy. I don't know if that makes sense. Because you can empathize with someone and, and sort of take on their quality emotionally. But compassion is when you can empathize with someone on one hand while seeing it in perspective and logic at the same time in a state of harmony. Like I'll give you an example. Let's say um, someone feels like really hard done by, right? There's like bad situation has come to them. To empathize with them is to feel shame. This poor person is the victim of the universe, right? That's empathy because they feel like they're a victim. So you empathize, you're going to be so absorbing their feeling that you'll be feeling that they've been victimized. But the logical thing would be to judge them and say, no, you're full of crap. <laughs> but the compassion would be to go, you know what? They are a victim, but they're a victim of their own choices. And that's the logic to be able to see how their choices have turned them into their own victim, but still very much a victim, but still by their own um, orientation. So I think of like the joystick controlling the um, flow of the energy. And so for me, when I think about compassion, it, it is like 
comp when it is combined and you know it's it's the masculine and the feminine have been synergized into a harmony and in the harmony compassion lives and i think compassion is what unites the empathy with the logic and otherwise the logic can be harsh and masculine and cold right and the emotion the empathy can be hot and overwhelming so if you're too much empathy you become so overwhelmed that you can't be compassionate if you got not enough empathy and you're too logical you're going to be too judgmental and unable to actually get the perspective of the middle path i don't know if that makes sense well what do you think as 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 an idea i think that makes perfect sense you even i was even like going to mention like the hot cold thing but then it's like oh you already you're already on that And so it's it's I think that like once again the masculine and feminine I, I don't know whether they exist as separate things. I think we have to be um, like we're swinging like a pendulum, and we're either one side or the other side. We swing to the maximum point of the inside, and we swing to the maximum point of the outside. So we swing from the center. To the to the to the circumference, from the center to the circumference. But compassion is when you on the middle the middle path. Compassion is when the pendulum is done swinging and it's reached the middle part, and all the vectors for one moment are resolved. Yeah, there's no forces acting on you this way or that way. You're not moving in any direction. At that one moment, you've reached perfect equilibrium before you start moving away from that equilibrium again. So I think compassion is is the expression of equilibrium. And so this is why it's so important for spiritual development. Because if one can bring one's energy into a state of equilibrium, then one won't be lost. And, and here is the problem with, with the religions. There seems to be so much judgment, so much masculine ideologies pushing like that religion's wrong. You know, you speak to a Muslim person and they'll tell you like you're you're an infidel, right? <laughs> you speak to a Christian person and they'll tell you that you're a heathen, right? <laughs> you speak to a um a Buddhist person and they'll say that you lacking in compassion. And you speak to a Hindu person and they'll say that you need to go and look outside of yourself for the devas and the devis, right? And so every religion sort of coming with its nonsense towards a particular judgment the one is saying that it's not within you maybe the one is saying that you are right if you're on this path or not that path and i think that th it actually drives us away from compassion i think that when we're trying to be compassionate we can't i know this is going to sound weird because in order to be compassionate all we need to do is to just feel deeply and be really logical and common sensible about what we're feeling and trying to apply it to ourselves if that makes sense like another human being's feeling that and apply those feelings to yourself and, and what what could make me feel this way and then try and get a balanced perspective of what it is and that's what it is so sometimes compassion can be quite um, tough loving like i'm learning this by being a father right empathy says oh shame man give that child more chocolate He's suffering. He needs more chocolate. That's the empathy, right? And I watched like the mother, you know, like he can wrap his mother around his finger. Daddy's the one who can get strict. Daddy's the one who can lay down the rules and say, right, that's it. The tablet's getting put away. You're not playing any more of your, um, um, uh, what's that game? He loves to play the building game. I don't know. It's, it's, it's everybody's playing it, right? Uh, um, something craft anyway you build stuff it's quite a cool game uh, like you've got square minecraft exactly <laughs> he loves he's falling in love with his minecraft so it's great because it's 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 giving me like leverage and i'm realizing how important that leverage is you know but at the same time because his mom's overly empathic she gets too hot so when she gets like freaked out she like loses her crap and the, like can get a bit much 
like loud and emotional and hysterical. Me, when I'm losing my crap, I get cold, calm, and collected. And I'm like, okay, that's it. Confiscating that, confiscating that. That goes in the box. You're not seeing that for days. You're not seeing that. And he cries. But I think that finding that balance between those two extremes of being too soft or being too hard is, is what compassion is. And it's sort of religion has moved away from that. And I think a lot of it has got to do with the, when we look at the astro theology, which is the basis of religion, it's very much looking outside of ourselves. And I think this is a point that um, Dr. K was making in the, in the early parts. And, and I'd love you to respond after, after me, Dr. K, tell me if I'm wrong, that part of the problem with the astro theological perspectives, even though it reflects very much of the truths, reflects a lot of the archetypal information, which is the structure within us, it's very easy to get drawn outside of ourselves and look outside there for the answers. Am I right? Kala, are you with us, brother? Well, yes. Um, essentially, the problem is having people uh, seated with this idea of looking outside of oneself. Um, because if you've, if that's already de quote unquote demonized, then you're going to run into a lot of a whole new world of trouble once you begin to see yourself as true opposites. So let, let's use the example of the Zodiac, right? Um, you have someone who's an Aries. Directly across from Aries is this opposite, right? no matter what your station is in life or what your entry point is, you're going to have an opposite and it's going to contradict. It's kind of like having um, or standing in an all black room. You're not going, you, you won't be able to see anything. If you're standing in an all white room, you're not going to be able to see anything. You need contrast, right? The magic is truly in the middle. So, the idea of demonizing an, a natural aspect of yourself creates this disassociation with, with self that can only, only lead to more ignorance. It, it leads to the dimension being saturated by all these pocket dimensions of complete untruth based upon ignorance and lack of knowledge of self. You know, so there's there's no way to get away from making something real, because even in ignorance, that energy is going to listen to what you tell it. So it will give you something to fear. It has no choice but to feed these powers that should not be. That is so true. Fear, and which is what takes us away from love. Love and fear drive us around this pendulum of being. And it's making me think about what you were saying earlier. I never actually got a chance to respond to that specifically about technology, how we are, in, a, in fact, regressing in a sense, considering the great technology that we did have some time ago, which is pretty damn obvious. All you got to do is just open your eyes when you look, look at history and see that we had some pretty we, we had we had our we had our ducks in the line. But um as they say in South Africa, you know, we had our ducks in the line. But um I think that the technology is also um in a sense it's it, it it's become a, a distraction and maybe in the past it became a distraction maybe that's why we sort of left left it behind in a sense maybe it becomes a distraction that takes you away from what we're talking about yeah that the whole universe is within us and as we move further out from ourselves into the world of technological control and manipulation of the, the manifestational world we possibly lose some notion of recognition and realization that the world within us is effectively the paradigm of control that we're living in. And perhaps the reality is that when we forget 
that we are an expression of the divine and that the divine is flowing through us and that every moment that we think it's a wheel that's turning within us and that wheel of thought that is turning within us is being turned by the power of the passion that is driven by the field of emotion and the very thoughts that we allow to cognitively associate in cycles around us are what becomes the substantial expression of the subjective emotional field that we are carrying within ourselves. And so it's like two pedals of a bicycle that go round and round and round and round, driving the dynamo of reality into being until we find ourselves sitting within the scope of manifestational reality that seems so substantial and real, and we can touch the circumference of reality and forget the absolute recognition of that nothing is the substance of reality, that that sub circumference is truly nowhere, and that the center is truly everywhere, and that the notion of the center within our beings becoming the expression of the consciousness field is what reality is, and that it is truly empty space being put into a construct through the virtue of thought being powered by the field of emotion. And that this, this power of thought, which is effectively driving us round in circles, is the, the reality that we, that we think that we are experiencing. But that reality is also very much just um, a subjective expression of what we think. And that the very nature of reality isn't real at all. That it is some kind of a simulacrum, some kind of a simulation. That we are indeed within the matrix of being. And that the structure of reality can be understood as the structure of our thoughts for our thoughts are the sacred geometric patterns of energetic resonant fields that become structuring segments of form through which the astral substance of the emotional field can flow like a dynamic field of energetic propulsion that drives the structure of reality round and round in a circle like the hands of a clock moving in patterns and cycles and that these patterns and cycles have to repeat themselves because the basis of reality is an expression of memory and the expression of memory has to work with what came before so since we are driving this reality and by when i say us i mean effectively the chain of life that is the expression of our beings which is a a, a long suspended, connected field of living beings that are expressing through different quantum matrices, different aspects of substantiality, like a, a, a huge construct consisting of little constructs within the large construct that makes larger constructs in this effective matrix of being that seems so profoundly obvious to our reality but is actually nothing more than a figment of our imagination or a dream a maya that we we bear with our eyes and drive through our thoughts and so we need to keep thinking in order to keep reality here and so reality produces the reactions of emotion that keep us thinking because when we feel we need to correlate those feelings and make sense out of those feelings. And so thought is the structure whereby we are able to make this happen. And um, so I do believe that the nature of this experience is definitely some kind of an octave resonant field from within that is resonating through us. And we are getting the feedback loop of that resonant field. And so we have this internalization and externalization of this resonant field which is our take and our give and that the causal body is indeed expressing the astral field into being so the energy of the causal field is flowing through the astral and it is bouncing off of the circumference and taking back currents of thought back towards the the, the center 
which is nowhere, but the center is expressing everywhere, for the circumference is going nowhere. And so there's, there's some kind of a magical notion behind the idea of reality in my mind. Um, I look at it like a child, yeah? Like if we stretch our minds, we can encompass a greater sphere of reality to the point where the small part of the reality that we thought that we were in becomes a cell in tissue and tissues in an organ and organs in a greater body. And we can call this notion God. And I think that we were able to experience this, this scalar reflection of consciousness within ourselves as being reflected in the macrocosm when we looked at the stars. And we're able to see the patterns in the stars reflecting the patterns within us. And so there was a recognition when we looked at these patterns in the stars of the wheels that turn recognizing there's a similar pattern there. I can relate to that because inside me, this is the pattern. And I believe that um, Dr. K was mentioning the Masloth earlier. And the Masloth is this, this wheel. Um, in fact, the... The angelic choir of the Masloth is the Alphanim. And the Alphanim is the wheels means wheels so the wheels that are turning turn the cogs that turn the wheel of our sky and those cogs are centered within us anyway there's my two cents worth i'd love for you guys to 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 throw something at the table if that's how do you feel about that That was uh, that was quite the download. I, th <clears throat> I think I might might be able to uh, end the show with that summation right there. That was uh, that was awesome. I don't, I'm still taking it in, so I don't have anything to say. Well, that yeah. Was... I, I I was I wanted to, uh, to second Aaron. That was that was brilliant. Um, it's you know in mystery schools for example um the initiate would study for a bare minimum of 40 years you know and that was that was in order to learn every practice that was currently being enacted and a majority of the ones that were that that weren't um to be able to properly focus all of that knowledge um, into an area of a community um, and then out into the world for, um, um, fully. Um, that requires a great deal of knowledge. It requires a great deal of focus. But ultimate, ultimately, it requires an understanding that everything in this world that you see, feel, hear, taste, is you. When we get away from that knowledge, you have false knowledge being created at every single turn. So, you know, this is why we have things like NASA. You know, NASA can only exist because of ignorance. The word itself is Hebrew to deceive. Now, that is a mockery twice over, because if we have so many Christians in the world, actual Christians, if we have so many Muslims in the world, if we have so many linguists and teachers and professors and pastors and priests and imams who know these languages, it should not just be these small pockets of consciousness on a round table on YouTube or in a witch's coven or in someone's basement that is having these kinds of conversations because they are largely um, ba based on societal judgment outlawed without uh, a, a said law ever, ever being in place. You see, this is how we get to this point. 
So uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful summation. I guess the only thing that comes to mind <clears throat> is that it reminded me of last weekend I had gone on this hike and I climbed this huge boulder and there once I got to the top and then the sun rose and there was a lot of people that started coming and I and I almost felt like we were all these little ants that were crawling on this giant living rock and we just it made me feel like it, as far as the etheric body, just like so small and how odd it must be for this rock to have all of these people that are always constantly coming and climbing up to the to the top of it and seeing the, the sun start to rise while the moon's setting in the opposite direction. And it while I was doing my meditation, it it allowed me to kind of transcend the feeling of me just being an ant on this rock, but move into the form of of the consciousness of being the rock and how how that rock looks and sees this city that has millions and millions of people but it's so small and when i'm looking at the the size of the moon you know that's setting in comparison to this huge city or or the size of the sun that's bringing light to this entire area and how people people can have this psychic phenomena that we can go through where we we're not just our our little bodies we can move into this space that starts to reflect all of reality and the the cosmic type consciousness and the larger body like bush whisper was describing and it it makes the the journey of going from the little ant on the boulder to being able to perceive this huge reality, the the form that it takes to to move into that space and the energetic kind of contraction. And, and uh, that, that was the image that, that came to mind. But it's something that's also just been on my mind for the, the past week as well. That's really beautiful, the intelligence of rock. Yeah, man. There's definitely a... I believe there's an intelligence in rock, you know. I believe there's an intelligence in every substance. And tuning into that intelligence is like a very ancient intelligence when things were bigger. And like it seems that like the further we go forward in time, things are contracting. Saturn's influence, yeah. The contraction is is getting more intense and matter is solidifying, getting more dense more hard, more solid. And possibly the rock is the residue of life from a different era. What a concept. But I'm, 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 get, I'm getting where you're going from. Beautiful, beautiful experience to be having on top of a beautiful rock. I saw your pictures of the sunrise. They look beautiful. So there's, there's nothing like being in a place. And, and when you're on a big rock like that, isn't it fascinating? It's like you're on an aerial for the sun. Because it's like it's one thing, and so it's it exerts a lot of magnetic pressure, you know, because of its density. I think of pressure as being a reflection of specific density, reacting to other specific densities within the harmonic field of harmonic resonance, you know, and the different um, range of harmonic resonant possibilities, right from the synchronous to the concord or the you know challenging resonance very interesting concept i remember when i was climbing over over um shringo la shringo la it's it's a big peak it's about five and a half five thousand fifty meters and if you come to shringo la where it comes into Himanshah Pradesh from Kashmiri side of Ladakhi. And if you go down the other side of Shingola, you must walk for about a day, probably about a day's walk. Mind you, it's high altitude because you're like, you're four, seven, 
4,700 to 5,100 at certain places like this, you know, range of altitude. So you're not walking that fast <laughs> at that altitude, you know, uh, you walk slowly. And um, there's this big rock out there. And I remember walking past this rock and my brain fizzled. And I was explaining to my ex-wife, I was like, oh my gosh, like how hectic is this? Like it was pulling in all this, it's literally one huge rock that's a mountain. And I mean, it's a mountain, man. My gosh, it's the biggest aerial I've ever seen in my life. And you can feel the iron in it, right? So I wonder if there was a lot of iron in your rock. And it was like literally pulling the sun towards it. And when I walked close to it, it was disturbing my brain's electrical field to the point that my brain was scrambled. And like as we got further away from it, it was like it was like shh, static, static, static. And as you got further from it, the static went away. Very interesting the way these rocks affect the static of our neurology. So it makes me wonder whether there's more life to rocks than what we realize. <laughs> Yeah, I kind of want to jump in on that's uh, something that's very interesting to me, the um, the idea of intelligence of rocks. I kind of had an interesting insight the other day in terms of like, so I was thinking to myself, what's the difference between organic matter, you know, idea of, you know, cells and stuff and inorganic matter, rocks, you know, water, crystal, etc. And one thing I kind of realized when I'm in the woods and I'm noticing that pretty much all organisms either have a kind of a softness to them or they have a kind of a, a bendable flexibility to them. And I realized it's that the thing about an organism, it's kind of a solid and liquid at the same time. If you think about a cell, it's kind of this, this solid membrane that's sort of filled with fluid. And these two things work together, which kind of goes back to the sort of the, the masculine and feminine thing. So it's like, if you think about it, we're all, we all have solid forms, we're all physical, but think every organism on the planet needs water to survive so there's obviously you need the water and with us there's also air so it's like we're basically you know basically rock water and air all at the same time and um so the way i see it it's like rocks are at a certain level of awareness but once it gets to that organic level it then it, it then ascends to the next like higher up level of awareness so basically when it comes to awareness, I have this sort of the system where there's like based on the colors. So you have like red, orange, yellow, green, and then it's blue, indigo, violet, and pink. Now, red, orange, yellow, and green, these are the, the uh the, the awareness levels for the physical. And then you have four astral awarenesses. And so at the end of each with red and pink, it's kind of like this, you know, all collective kind of awareness. And then as it goes up and it goes inward that the awareness becomes more specific and more specialized until at the center you get the individual self. So if I would think about my theory right now is that, um, so basically the sort of like the, uh, explained from the physical with, you start out with the, the red level awareness, which is, you know, basically just like pure information, pure intellect, pure logic, kind of just like, the mind of the universe then at the orange level that information takes on form and it becomes energetic so rocks i believe would be at the yellow level and then the green level that's like the organic level so there i think in a lot of ways there is a truth to the idea that there is intelligence in rocks but what's also interesting about these colors is that they're sort of they reflect into the astral so red reflects is sort of related to pink orange is related to purple yellow to indigo etc so if we have if the thing about like the idea of the elementals so an element or like you know if you think of like a crystal for example that would be in the sort of the yellow physical level of awareness but in the astral it's reflected into the indigo level of awareness which is related to like stories archetypes mythological figures that sort of thing and it's like we take the energy from the physical that sort of primordial intelligence. And then we sort of extrapolate that into a sort of a tangible archetypical form in the astral plane. So it's like, there's this kind of this, the symmetry and like we, we, it's like there's this intelligence of the rock. And then we decide to associate that rock intelligence with a, 
a little gnome that has a pickaxe. And that's it's basically so the rock is like the intelligence in the physical world. And then the gnome is sort of the the astral or etheric, as you say, sort of reflection of that. So when I think of uh, so, yeah, definitely the idea of like minerals being intelligent, I think is also and that kind of brings me back to another point about the religion thing, because one thing I've kind of noticed with a lot of, you know, getting beyond just religion itself, let's just talk about how we orient our, our sense of consciousness. Now, I feel like even though, you know, we definitely live in a more secular materialist world, I think a lot of our understanding of consciousness has to do with sort of Rene Descartes, where he, he, he used the famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. Well, his whole concept was that he thought that the intellect and the soul is something that's it's separate from nature, right? And I think because of that, we tend to focus all of our attention as being, we think we only identify with our awareness and we don't identify necessarily with our physical body. We just think it's something we shed. I think that literally it's not that our soul, it's like we've been taught this idea that our soul only exists in our brain and that our, our body is like this foreign entity, which I think the, the better holistic way is to think that our soul basically kind of fills up our entire body and you think of the analogy like our soul is like uh it's like water and like our body is like a glass that it sort of fills up and we're not really filling up the entire glass that's one of the reasons why too like i think that a lot of these uh religions tend to like demonize sexuality because it's like that sexuality because we only identify with our heads and we don't identify with the other head you know below our legs we think oh this is a foreign entity that's trying to control us, it's trying to manipulate us, not realizing that's actually part of who we are. So I, I don't know, I, I kind of like, <laughs> I went off on a weird, I didn't think I was going to even go off on that tangent, but one more thing I want to say about, uh, about rock intelligence, I think that when it comes to um, the difference between rocks and organisms, I think that crystals are the missing link. Because if you think about what a crystal is, it's a, it's a, some it's a it's a mineral that is not necessarily shaped by outside forces. Most rocks they're faced by either erosion from water, pressure from tectonic plates, but crystals move based on their own internal fluctuations. And so, in that sense, I feel like crystals are kind of the link between sort of like rock and organism in the same way, like a platypus. It's kind of like the in-between of a bird and a mammal. You're, you, you got me thinking of two things. <clears throat> so one, I, I it made me think of, um, so I grew up Catholic and the uh, level of ritual and programming and like you're sitting and standing and saying different phrases and you do the same thing over and over. And I was someone who went to a Catholic middle school. So we went to church multiple times a, a week. And then I was also in the, the choir and played guitar in a, in a Catholic church. And so I repeated these actions over and over. And then I spent a long period of time away from the Catholic church. And then now, like I went back just for, for the, the heck of it. I think it was a few months ago. But I was surprised at how strong that that programming and identity kind of just reappeared by entering into the the atmosphere. And all of a sudden I remembered things and phrases and stuff that I had not thought about in, in years. And it, it made me think of how strong the the programming is from a religion in order to train a series of thoughts. And the one thing that allowed me to when I was younger, I think I was probably in in high school or maybe, you know, around 18. But the only thing that was able to disrupt and break through that programming was the first time that I really felt in love with a woman and and I wanted to have this life. And I started to dream and imagine a new reality that I could live in with this um, sacred kind of communion between the masculine and the feminine and that love and emotion was the only thing that was strong enough to break through from the religious programming for me to come to the realization that i loved this reality that i wanted to live in more than 
the conditioned way of how I thought things were supposed to go and how I was supposed to behave and it was supposed to work this way. And so that's also how I think I came up with the idea that the, the heart and love is capable of generating the internal cataclysm that is strong enough to break through some of the the strength of the programming from religions because I feel like sometimes we don't give it enough uh, credit, not credit, but the, the strength of that programming is so strong that it is very difficult for people to break through from it. And I know from my own experience, it was that way. And it just felt like I was in a, in a entrained fog and that, that love was the only thing that really was able to break through from it and allow me to retrain my mind. I think when it comes to the religion thing too, it's not just the uh, the conditioning. I think it's also just being in the presence of other people who believe in the thing. So I kind of mentioned earlier about how, you know, we all basically live in our own universe. What happens with what religion does is it's like, instead of living in your own universe, you kind of live in this sort of shared universe. So when you go, when you, so for example, when you go to church, and you feel overwhelmed a lot of that i've been starting to think is actually just because you're just in there even though you don't believe by just by being around those people you sort of intersect into their sort of like their astral dome so to speak it's like you go inside and you see that they're all kind of you know propping it up and there's all this power behind it just be, just because there's so so many people so many millions and millions of people are sort of willing this thing into existence and no matter how you know strongly in your mind you think that the belief system doesn't make sense or that it may seem illogical just being around those people in that world you feel like you're starting to get sucked in it's starting to feel real again so um where else was i going to go with this but um the idea that when it comes to like yeah because like religion in a sense every religion is a universe every religion is a world and you know you, you enter that world when you're around other people and i think that like a good way to understand what i'm talking about like you ever been in a situation where you disagree with a group of people like maybe you're they believe in one thing and you believe in this even though it makes sense to you in your mind and you have good arguments just the fact that you have all these people just like you know in your face and they're all agreeing with the same thing and you're the only one that doesn't agree it feels really overwhelming and um i don't remember that that as maybe somebody can correct me but of the uh, the name of the experiment of the psychologist who did this but there's this one psychological experiment where they take um they take one person that's the person they're experimenting on and then they put them in a room with a bunch of actors and then they they put this like board on the wall and there's uh there's four lines and and basically the idea is that you have to pick the shortest or the longest line i guess it doesn't really matter it's just like you pick the shortest line and what the experiment does is all the actors will deliberately lie and pick the wrong answer and the experiment is to see if the person will conform with the group so maybe like c is is clearly the shortest line but everybody in the room picks a and then you feel like well maybe i'm wrong for picking c because everybody else is picking a and that's kind of what religion does to you in a sense metaphysically it's like because there's so many people believe in this in the same thing you start to think wait i'm the outlier here so that's so to me when you encounter a religious belief system or any kind of belief system even if you totally disagree with this the belief system and, and you know in your mind it's totally wrong you still can't help but feel overwhelmed when you know you're the only one facing a bunch of people who believe in some some different thing. That's very interesting because it it's it sounds like you're talking about harmonic resonance on one level and peer pressure how it is the conforming expression of harmonic resonance on another level. But um I'll, I'll I'll add to that on a slightly different note, and this is interesting. Um, let's say, let's say you've developed a certain amount of ESP, 
extrasensory perception that you can sense energy or non-physical reality. And you're in an environment with people that have no sense of that. And they have a structured thought pattern which inhibits them from experiencing that at all. Um, and if there's a group mind, because there's group, we're talking about group consciousness here, how group minds form, it makes it more difficult for one to experience that state of consciousness where one is able to transcend the physical laws of reality and experience the internal expressions of the consciousness field as an abstraction where one starts to almost want to doubt one's own connection and feeling and with regards to reality. And it's very interesting how this group mind of harmonic resonant fields resonate and condition us and our thinking patterns. And so there's this consensus reality that we're living in, right, that says that we can't, like, break the rules <laughs> right of reality because they are what they are like you can't make yourself lighter and and when i was competing and i was young i was sure i could change my weight on the scale and how many times um i'd get on the scale and i'd be no this isn't right like, sorry give me a minute i was literally like this and all my senses, the senses that were doing this, the weighing ins, because the, all the teachers have to do the weigh ins. I'd be like, I'm not ready. They'd be like, What do you mean you're not ready? <laughs> <laughs> I want to be a little bit heavier. Just give me a second. I've got to, like, I'm, I'm, I jump on the scale. I'm not quite in the category I want to be in. I want to be in a slightly heavy, heavier category because. Yo, I used to like just used to hospitalize the bigger guys. So I didn't want to be with the smaller guys because like they're gonna get carried off to like on stretches and stuff. So I'd 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 basically concentrate on making my body heavier. And I'm telling you that that was the, the difference of a kilogram. <laughs> and they would weigh me and I get off the scale, I'd be like, no, no, no. Like, like one more time, and they'd be like, seriously, how many times do you want us to wait? I'm like, please, another chance. Just give me a minute. I just got to concentrate. They'd be like, well, we concentrate. Like, <laughs> what do you mean you got to concentrate? And, and I would get on, and they'd like be scratching their heads, looking at the scales, because it's not a digital scale, right? When you're weighing in for fights, it's got to be the old school scales, right? Because they don't trust digital scales. It's those proper scales with the all the little things that you move, you know, and the very, very accurate scales. And they'd have to like check it and double check it. And they'd be scratching their heads trying to understand like, okay, we just written you up in that category, but now you're going to fight in that category. So, I, I, you know, we are taught to think that we're stuck in this paradigm, but actually we're not as stuck as what we think we are. You know, we have a lot of, when we recognize that the whole reality is expressing our internal being into this external reality, then it's sort of, there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that idea, right? And I think everybody wants to deny that responsibility. And I think that's where the astro-theological, well, it's not me, it's out there. It's, you know, in the past. Because it's like, I'll give you another example. If you've been on a lot of entheogens, right? And you're like, the reality is like fluids, right? The whole reality is just a bunch of fluids all meeting. You're too scared to interact with the fluid of reality with your mind in case you change something. Have you ever had that? <laughs> you like got to rein yourself in, like don't touch anything with your thoughts because like if you touch it, it might change. And you, you can get a little bit wary of this, like damn, I must be careful what I do with my thoughts. I might accidentally change reality. And it's, it's, it's a valid thought, right? When you're seeing just how fluid reality is, Noticing that these are just like fluid currents, like like what happens if I push my thoughts into that fluid current and I make that fluid current go like that, right? Something's going to change. So, um, I think that's sort of partially what's happening with what you're talking about, cosmic. Check me if I'm wrong, but there's literally a, 
a mass pressure of consciousness, even if nothing is said, even if those people aren't physically saying that to you, even if they're just thinking it, just experiencing it in their internal consciousness, I think it will affect our consciousness fields. I, I think I kind of see what you're talking about. You know, another thing I've kind of noticed too is that it's kind of like, I, I can't really quite articulate the specifics of it, but it's like, I feel like people who have different belief systems have different energetic vibes to them. Like there's like, you can, you just kind of feel like, I don't know, like when you're around Christians, you kind of feel like a, like a gold kind of like glowy energy. When you're around atheists, you, in their mind, you kind of think of like black starry skies or something like that. Like there's a certain like energetic feeling, a sort of like a magnetic feeling when you're around somebody who is versus like a skeptic or a believer. It's like when you're around like a believer, yeah, I guess this is an interesting thing too, because when I, I channel the Fae, like I, I do it with, you know, other people online and, you know, I've encountered different types of people, some people who are, you know, more believing and some people who are more skeptical. And it's kind of interesting to see how different people like interact with them. So, you know, if someone's like, you know, more of a believer, they'll, you know, really be able to feel, feel the Fae, you know, synchronicities will start to happen. But it's like, but when you're on a skeptic, it's like there's this like this this cold black fluid that just like neutralizes all the psychic energy around you, and it's like, and they're like, no, I don't feel anything. I didn't notice anything. There's no there's no synchronicities here, and it's just like you can, it's like yeah yeah. Even when they don't say anything, it's almost like you feel like there's something that's like when you're around like a skeptic, you feel like there's something like like a, a black hole sucking in all the psychic energy in the room. So yeah, I definitely can um, see what you're talking about there. That reminded me of another example. So I, I spent a lot of time in uh, accounting and finance. And so I noticed when I would jump to different cities and these different jobs, it was almost like the creation of its own little reality. Like the businesses are kind of that way. And so I would go in as an outsider and these people would be, they've spent decades you know, in this business, doing things a set certain way. And so they're used to it producing certain results and they don't want it to be stirred up or deviated. And my my archetype of person is to jump in, stir things up, see what people know, you know, and then and then uh, carve a little bit of a different path and start illuminating kind of uh, minds and, and doing things a little differently. So I'd be evaluating like these big construction projects and so they would have it in their mind that oh this construction project is going to cost you know a hundred million dollars and we've done the model and this guy knows what he's doing and this person you know we trust him and they've done a good job for decades and i'm like you know guys i i've got a different way of of doing things we, that works a little bit better with the accounting and the math I ran the numbers and then here's the result. That project is not actually profitable. You're actually losing money because you made this bad decision, this bad decision, this person, you know, didn't buy things this way. And you could just see they're just like, they erupt into like panic. They're like, no, no, you know, that, that can't be. We've done things, you know, a certain way. Our reality is fixed in this form. We can't have you disrupting our view of reality because then, you know, the person we thought who was a great, purchasing supply chain director might not actually be that good you know that that priest who was doing all of his magic in the background he might not actually know what what he was doing or have the knowledge that he said and so i i learned that i needed to be very careful about disrupting the reality of 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 people and 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 that form because it can cause people to exhibit exhibit kind of like those different frequencies and forms that you're describing and different energies and and they want to find someone to uh, to punish or attack and put their little reality back together yeah you must have been really popular <laughs> no I, I definitely had to learn learn the hard way with that first for a long time i was like well we're in a business to do a job and you want me to determine profitability and fix things and i'm very data oriented and it's got to be this way and so i provide the information and the truth and we should all reorient and go towards the goal and that is not what people actually want to do so they're and and then it made me realize people have different motivations too they've got this internal world with private motivations and then what they're willing to 
say and talk about on the outside. And then I realized, well, things are a lot more complicated. Maybe somebody wants to protect a certain interest because, you know, they've promised their wife a vacation. And so they've got to do whatever's required in order to make sure they get their bonus or whatever. And this project's got a, a certain way because somebody had dinner with this big shot and told them it was going to be this way. And so no matter what's actually going on in reality, we've got to ensure that we craft another little reality as a group for this person. And, and so it's interesting that people are kind of these psychic and magic people and they craft their own little perceptions of reality and they work together to put it on to somebody else to stir things. And I, I find it almost a miracle that a lot of these organizations can even, even function when I actually look how they operate and all the individual motivations and things going on. And, and but sometimes I think of society that way too. It's, it's almost a little bit of a miracle that people, things can function as well as, as, as they do. Yeah, that that is that is very interesting, and it's sort of looking at the astro theology, which is the basis, I believe, from when religion sprung. It doesn't express in a simple and definable context the monotheistic concept because when we start looking at the heavens and the stars like okay so who's responsible for this is everything just going around the sun no well actually each thing is having a little bit of input right each thing is having a little bit of effect and this one's having more effect here that one's having more effect there the moon's having a big effect here the sun's having a big effect there the stars have this effect here and so the the you know the the Masloth came into being, like um Dr. K was saying in the beginning, looking at the, the entirety of the heavens and understanding that each part is part of the whole and that the Masloth is the whole. So Masloth you could think of as another term for God. I mean it means the zodiac, doesn't it? Um and so like for example, if you go to India. There, there is a word for God in India, but it's not very commonly used or understood. It's Bhagwan, right? Bhagwan means divine. And when we speak of Bhagwan, we're talking about how everything is part of one construct. And Bhagwan is the entirety of the construct. But then when you look into the details of Bhagwan, you'll see there's Ganesha, there's Shivaji, there's Lakshmi Devi. There's, you know, Vaishnu, there's the Parabaram, um, the intention in moving through the field. So you've got all these different aspects of, of the creation, the, the different archetypes, the different guides, the different structural, structuring intelligences that produce the, the patterns that we ex associate with reality. And it sort of makes me think about what you were saying earlier, Cosmic, about the soul. That is such a beautiful um, point that you brought up because the Masloth, if you look at it in terms of, you know, what it means, is it's expressing that reality is the zodiac, but the zodiac are the intelligent forces, aspects of Godhead working in synergy as an expression of the Elohim, right? From that particular perspective in order to find a construction for the Elohim to move through, because the Masloth relates to the 12, essentially, or the 13. But the 12 are the obvious, the 13th is the hidden. I like to think of it as the 13th is when the 12 are operating as one, but the 12 are when they are looked at in their separation. But there isn't actually 12, because there's actually they are all operating under the auspicious auspices of the 13th effectively but we look at the 12 as seeing the mystic notion of the 13th i hope that makes sense but when we do do consider it in this way we then see that the seven are what's produced by the 12 so the 12 are polarities of five sets of polarities like the five fingers 
and they fit together to form 10. And these are an instrument of the right and the left hand in order to bring them together to pray. So now we've got 12. But when we look at these 12, we see that there's the right and the left, the pinkies, that, that, and that, and that. And now we suddenly got seven. So when we put the two hands together, we got seven functions, but they consist of 12 functions. And so that's something worth noting. And the seven functions are expressing the eight, or the form of, of Saturn's cube, reality. And the 12 functions are expressing the um, synergy of the 13, as an expression of synergy. I believe 13 represents synergy. Maybe Dr. K could jump on in on this because this, this is his forte. What, what does 13 represent? 13 is representative of the center, uh, the circumpunk, um, the black dot, the uh, circle with a, within a circle with a wheel within a wheel. Uh, ultimately, it is the hidden four or the or the the true foundation. When you reduce it, of course, we get four. This is why you can look at um, you can essentially look at anything, and we can say it has a religious over or undertone. Uh, for example, um, you have twelve disciples in the. Um, canonical Bible, right? But only four of those disciples have gospels. So we can we can see an obvious blatant allegory for the 12 months of the year and the four seasons. You see, um, is we can say it's religion, but it's really just our own physiology and how we work. Um, the realm is the same kind of reflection. There's a micro and macro aspect to it. Um, but the 13 is the complete, what we, what we could say zodiac or the complete wheel. Smoke that shit, Andy. <laughs> but today, and today came out to be a 13 before I reduce it down to four. Did you say it was foundational? I love that. We, we, we have an interesting conversation happening here in the chat where we have the um, Kriakos, I hope I'm saying that right, suggesting that um, Orthodox Christianity, the Orthodox way is the truth and it does matter and it does have a big difference. The difference is as big as one choosing to embrace life or death. What an interesting choice uh, set of words to choose. Um, and the word orthodoxy. Okay, so now we've got to play with words, don't we? Orth, orthodontist. So orth, ort, has got to do with what we express through our mouth, right? Um, and dox, has got to do with documents, but where they meet in the Saturn's cross. So the structured teachings that come from the mouth. And Orthodox Christianity. The thing about Orthodox Christianity, let's get into this. And I don't know if you know this, but Dr. K was actually, he's got a bit of, quite a lot of background in this. I'm sure he's going to jump on and have a lot to say. But I see Orthodox Greek Christianity as probably being one of the oldest. And then, of course, you've got Roman Catholic Orthodoxy. And then you've got the original Orthodoxy, which came before Catholicism, which is the Gnostic Christianity, which is what people were practicing before they were forced to call it Christianity. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different Orthodoxies. And they don't all agree. I don't know. What do you say, Dr. K? Ooh, well, 
Um, let me first say I don't I, I don't wish to offend anyone. Um, but you know, uh, if your faith is real, it is, and you are unoffendable. So, um, the idea of orthodox anything is extremely pigeon pigeonholing because it is saying this is this. And for anything outside of this, you can die, be excommunicated, be tortured, be killed, be mocked for all time, all the way down to your family line. So we have to understand the power of quote unquote words and current modern and ancient definitions and interpretations of them, right? So you know, just by way of saying orthodox, something, if not any and everything outside of that is now your sworn enemy. So I, I, I want to put that in proper perspective. Um, now, as it is believed, as it is known, and as it is practiced, so shall it be true. So it's not for me to say that this religion is true or this religion. Is, I understand enough about religion. And this is what got me into trouble very, very early on in, in life, you know, six, seven, eight years old. Because when you study to become a pastor, you have to study every religion. Was sad to me, um, which was sad to me then, as, as as much as it is more so now. You would think that would be a common practice, if there was an idea, or even a possibility that God could also be this, or this, or this, or this. Even the. Uh, the adage of God exists in the church and God exists in the whorehouse, right? When you think about where Jesus operated, he operated in the hoods, the barrios, the slums. He didn't go to the rich people. He recruited rich people. He recruited tax collectors. He recruited prof profitable fishermen. I will make you fishers of men. We're talking about the Piscean age here also. So there's not this level of mysticism or power because when you actually get into true eschatology, right, which is the literal study of the end times, you'll see that there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that we have already lived past the millennial kingdom of the so-called Jesus Christ, right? We know that the J is less, is just over 500 years old. Before that, it was an I. We know that Jesus comes from Isis, right? Or Jesus, however you want to choose to say it, but, but Zeus, right? We know how this has been changed over epochs and eras. So we have to go again to the root. We have to look to the sky. This is why in Christianity, in the majority, in most forms, Astrology, astrotheology, numerology, soothsaying, witchcraft of any sort or kind is forbidden and outlawed. And it used to be punishable by death. You know, so, you know, these while these things have changed in terms of law to a large degree, in terms of societal thought, not much has changed at all. It's actually been increased. Very true. Very true. I can say that as a Christian myself who doesn't go to church, every church that I have gone to, I always found out that I didn't fit in because of the way they that, that the people thought, practiced their faith, and were very 
narrow-minded in the in the way they saw the world. Like it had to be this way, or it was, or you were a sinner. I that think... really made me stop going to church because I, I did have I did have a sense to go to church as in to connect with other Christians, but every time that I tried, I just bumped against a solid rock wall that I'm like, I don't fit here. That's very, very well observed. It's, it's often been my experience too. And I think the it's reason for reminded-ness. that... I just, I just, I, it frustrates me to the core. I see that not only with Christians, but with everyone who practices something. It, it, it has to be their way or the highway. And I'm like, uh, hello, what about other ways? Perhaps. It's even present in the New Age community, I've noticed. Exactly. When people start arguing about this alien race and that alien race and this, this yeah. story and that story. And it, it just gets ridiculous to the point because, like, the, the point's being missed. Yeah, because the whole, the whole philosophy Look. behind it is being lost because of all of the narrow-mindedness. This is probably a good good moment to look at the basis for the astrotheology. Okay, so let's... Dr. K was throwing out some pearls looking at the ESS yes story and where these words came from. So, okay, I'll give you my perspective of Emmanuel. And obviously we need to recognize that the word Christ, there was never ever a moment ever that Emmanuel was called Christ. That's a later invention by the Greeks. Um, when they had that council in Rome, yeah, and they invented the Catholic tradition. So there were Jews. Emmanuel himself declared himself to be a Jew. It's in it's in the Bible, written a, a lot of times. So there was two forms of Judaism. There was um, Orthodox Judaism, and then there was a breakaway form of Judaism that was taught by the Master Emmanuel. Now, who was this Emmanuel? We could we could look at this from a perspective and say that the as absolute center of creation was being expressed. So I'm just looking at what these dogs are up to. <laughs> they're up to no good. <laughs> they're getting on each other's nerves. But um, so there there was this this breakaway tradition of this Emmanuel taking on a very powerful state of consciousness of perfection. So from, from a deeper perspective, I would look at it like this, right? So the son of God is from ancient times an ancient tradition, the son, the son can be spelt S O N or S U N. The son of God is the source of all life. The sun, S-O-N, S-U-N, is what gives endlessly. The sun sacrifices the self in order to save the many. The sun, S-U-N, is giving life force and prana. All of the life force and prana traveling within it is being given out so that plants can grow, so that everything can survive and become animated and alive. Without the sun, S-U-N, there would be no life. So the Son of God um, emerges after being dead for three days. That's the winter solstice. So in the north of, of the world, the winter solstice is reached on the 22nd of December. And then there are three days that are counted according to the ancient astrological, astrotheological concepts when the sun emerges and the movement is back towards spring. And during those three days are the times where most things will die. Winter, winter solstice. It's got to do with 
uh, resources, what has happened at that point will dictate whether things survive. So it's got to do with life and death. It's got to do with eternal life. In other words, the perpetuation of life or it getting too cold that all the plants die and then everybody and everything just dies because that's the reality. So the sun can then be considered as the son of God. And God's life is God's love. And God's life is expressed in the world as love. And that love is what is able to be turned into a crystal, right? So the love that comes out of the sun of God, S-U-N, is what turns into crystals so that the rest of us can eat the body of the sun, right? So now we're seeing where that ritual comes from. Drinking the blood, eating the body. Literally, the S-U-N shines out all its powerful love. The plants are able to interact with that love and alchemically change that love into a crystallized form of love, sugar crystals. Those sugar crystals then become what we eat to sustain our bodies, the bread of life. So you can see how these rituals have evolved from ancient astrotheological principles. Just to, a few little notions there to understand the sun. Now, Emmanuel was, from my perspective, highly perfected, probably the oldest soul. I think Shemyaza might be um, related. There might be a relation between Shemyaza and Emmanuel. And Shem meaning the name. And Ia Za, Ia, Ia meaning um, the name of the Tetragrammaton, which is the name of God. That's something that the Bible forgets, is that there was no word God ever written. That was a translation of a translation. But when you look at the original script, it's actually got uh, God names. And so there's different God names. There's Adonai, there's Aloha. There's Al, there's Ia, there's the Tetragrammaton, which is normally replaced by Adonai in more modern texts. But in the traditional original texts, it would have been the Tetragrammaton, which is Yod He Vav He. And um, Shaddai, which you mentioned before, um, Indi, Al Shaddai. Shaddai is mentioned meaning sort of like um, of great power, almighty. So there's all these seven different aspects of Godhead, known as the Elohim, which is also mentioned. And so the whole Old Testament has got all these different aspects of God with all different names, particularly. And the Elohim is a particularly interesting one because it, it relates to the masculine it begins with a masculine prefix and ends with a feminine suffix. <laughs> wow. So there's a masculine energy embedded into a feminine result, um, which produces the seven rays, the seven tongues of God, the seven beings that administrate over reality. And these are a reflection of the Masloth that we were talking about before, which is also mentioned quite clearly in the old testament the original the original text of the old testament so when name? we look at it it reads a bit like a pagan handbook yeah what was their name again whose name uh, it was a female and male combination and that that's that's um um elohim oh, elohim right okay that's what yeah. i was thinking the, the suffix is feminine and the prefix is masculine yes. so you could relate that to God, goddess, if you really want to. And there's seven aspects of the Elohim, seven, seven personalities coming through. And then there's, there's another version which consists of four. The Sphinx is mentioned, but it's not called the Sphinx. Um, Ezekiel's vision goes into this, interestingly enough. Ezekiel's vision is, is something worth studying. Uh, yeah. the, uh, the way it breaks down the numerations. It's, it's a powerful transcript of numerology. Ezekiel vision has a has a plural suffix, I believe. Plural female. Sorry, suffix. Elohim is a plural yeah. word. 
So, it's singular uh, in its beginning and plural in its in its ending. Yeah. Uh, the the beginning part is a is a stem word masculine. The yeah, suffix, a masculine singular makes it a plural word. Pluralizes the masculine, but makes it also feminine. Exactly. So like what we would say, gods and the gods and goddesses, we would say. Well, so if you would say, um, you guys, it means everybody, including women. It'd yeah. be like that, but whereas they're saying you girls, but it includes the guys. Yeah. That's that's what they're saying, but it's they're saying a plural word, the pantheon. Exactly, exactly. That's what we're talking about. So, but it's also maintaining that the pantheon is singular. Mm. That we the L. that way now. From well, I mean, when you look at the L, the 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 Aleph and the Lamet is the first letter of the Hebrew. And the Lamet is the middle letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if you break the Aleph, the, the alphabet, into 11 and 11, they each start. The first 11 starts with Aleph, and the second 11 starts with Lamet. So those two are very important signifiers in terms of beginnings. And the first 11 are polarities of the second 11. I hope this makes sense. Yeah. And so when you speak of Eth, like the the um, etheric field, you're speaking about the alpha and the omega, because tav is the last letter of the second eleven, and eth is the first letter of the first eleven, and so they fit head to tail, and so eth becomes a reflection of the ouroboros of the magician, right? The 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 around the waist, so like there's there's, there's a lot of interesting astrotheology to be understood in the Bible. Um, it's profound when you look at it. And um, who's Gog and Magog? It's mentioned in the Bible, but it's not mentioned much. These are the giant cities, giant um, civilizations. There was the civilization of Gog, the land of Gog, and the land of Magog. And so the, we're talking about the Nephilim's Anakim offspring, because the Nephilim, according to the Bible, the angels came down, broke their covenant with God, came down to earth. Now, from our Greek scripts, we can see that there were exactly 200 of them because the Greeks went to study the documents in the ancient library in Egypt, right, before it was burned by the, by the, the crusaders. And so they had come out with 200 of these beings had landed on earth. And they then started to mess with women to make hybrids, right? Hybrid beings. And those hybrid beings became the Nephilim. And then the Nephilim further hybridized and became the Anakim. And the Anakim were the giants. And so we know that the Bible is mentioning that there was giants. In the, there's, there's not enough mention of the giants in the Bible. It's been edited. It's been badly edited. It's been overly edited. Like it's been heavily edited. They mentioned Galeot, Galeot as being the last giant. But according to other references of other texts, we can say that Galeot's two brothers will also survive the flood. So there were three giants that had survived the flood that we know of. And I'm sure that they would have been repopulating and creating more offspring using women, right, to, to produce more monstrous beings. And so the, the beings became more and more demonically spawned and monstrous as time moved forward. So there's definitely a lot of interesting um, astrotheological insights to be understood here because the whole concept of the Nephilim comes from the beings which were angels that came from the stars to earth, according to the Bible. So... There's, when you start to break it down, and I'm pretty sure that all the religions come to similar ideas and consensus, you definitely see the same stories being told in Zoroastrian. The same stories are told by the indigenous religions here, and also the Osa religion here, and the Zulu religion of South Africa. They speak about the Chiturga. The Chiturga were the lizard people. They're called the Nagas in India that came to earth and the Chuturga were teaching the humans all many kinds of things and taught 
apart from magic and how to um, farm and stuff, a lot of knowledge to human beings. And so the Chaturga <clears throat> are considered to be not from this world. They came here and they, they've got a lizard-like aspect to them, um, which is in the Bible considered to be called the Archons. And the Archons are the same beings. So the, the, the New Age religions are basically reiterating much of the stuff in the Bible. They've just changed what how they put it, right? Exactly. Many, many New Age movement. The whole New Age movement was founded by a woman who practiced Satanism and replaced every word of God by that the God is within you instead of so outside of uh, themselves. We have a God spark. But we are not God. We got some interesting notions in the chat coming through. Yeah, let's see what's been said. Um, okay, so believe that and you'll have an everlasting life. Somebody asked about the Tokalosh. So the Tokalosh here yeah, in South Africa are beings. Um, the Tokalosh has got a name in Hebrew, right? Did you watch the 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 um the three towers? Yeah, the Lord of the Rings. What was the Tokalosh called in the Lord of the Rings? Golem. What is a golem? A golem is a being that is magically created. The Tokalosh is a being that is magically created by witches in and different shaman from African traditions. Um, it's shrouded in mystery, but <clears throat> they are definitely the helpers of certain spirits and certain beings. So they are either created by spirits or created by the witches using spirits to create these beings. And they're a small being. Um, I believe it's been suggested that children are used. Now, there was this practice in Europe, and this is going to get heavier. Huh? So if, if you've got a light heart, then then... Turn off the volume for about five minutes. But they used to take children and twist the children around in Europe. It was a, it was a practice done black magic. It's, it's a severe. And they would turn these children into troubadours, and they would turn these children into fools. You know, the fools in the court warped the hunchback of Nostradamus as an example. I'm sure Dr. K would probably know quite a lot about this. And they would twist these children into make them miniaturized and turn them into weird creatures. Sometimes even experimenting in mixing animal parts onto them and, and, and sculpting animal parts onto the humans. As in like, you know, like when you take a plant and you grow two things together. They used to practice such weird kind of genetic modi um, modification. This is like thousands of years. It's been going on for long. So the Tokolosh, I believe, is is a perversion of a child that is basically um, messed with, like a CD. They wipe it as clean as possible and have this child become possessed by a particular spirit that can be controlled by the witch or the, the magician and make sure that this child remains small and will act out the, the whims of the person that created it or spiritual being that created it so that's what i know about the tokolosh though you, you can't really speak about the tokolosh with many traditional people because they won't they're scared of it even the sangomas are very wary of the tokolosh which is why in south africa very often people will not sleep on the ground traditional people because they they don't want the tokolosh to be able to mess with them when they're sleeping so they will um, raise their beds up to stay out of the reach of the Tukalosh. Um, so it's, it's got a lot to do with the, the spiritual forces that are moving through the Tukalosh and that they move along the earth grid lines. So, yeah, I mean, that that's that's a hectic story. Hello, take a lot. I mean, sorry, take a little trip with me. Big love, big blessings. Um, so somebody was saying about the Tukalosh, that's about the Tukalosh, which is like heavy, distorted magic. Do, do you guys know about what they used to do to children in the Middle Ages? 
in order to twist the children and change them? Any of you? Yeah, it's, it's a lot of the same practice practices that we have today. Um, anybody who's familiar with ballet, for example, um, what they do to the toes, um, you know, that comes from the idea of mummification. Um, if you look into, and there's a, a point I wanted to make earlier, I forgot that will um, actually tie back into this. Um, in terms of the word Christ, um, the Greeks were not the first. That word comes <laughs> from the Egyptians uh, or the Kemites or the Tamerians who had the Kadesh, the K-R-S-T, right? The idea of, of God in incarnation. Um, but if you if you really study, uh, I, I would recommend Michael Cremo's work, Forbidden Archaeology. Um, there are these massive ossuaries in Egypt um, and all over the world um, that purported science never talks about. Um, even that horrible show, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to mention it, the show from the History Channel. Um, that, that says everything's about aliens that don't exist. Um, there's these massive ossuaries that have mixed bone dust from different different animals, different species, showing um, genetic modification. When we look at the pantheon of Egypt, we understand, um, just like in Sumeria and many others, um, the idea of merging this animal with that or uh, alchemizing a lion into a cat or vice versa or having a man with the head of an animal, um, this, th this combination, um, that gets turned into the corruption of knowledge. Because whereas you had this priestess uh, class and priest, priesthood class of, of information that was now because of warfare made available to any and everyone. Um, you have power being corrupted. So you can, ha you, you can have these golems, um, very, very popular in the Hebrew or the Jewish community. Um, and also in Islam with the idea of jinn, um, there, there are a lot of similarities. Um, this also turns into the idea of um, servitors, um, even uh, quote unquote dark fairy. Um, all of that plays under under this umbrella. There's a, there's a lot of mythology in any and all cultures. It just depends on where you where you want to focus, and it does get incredibly dark. Yeah, there's definitely um, a lot of a lot of darkness in what we're talking about here, and so this is the dark side of religion, and um, it was it was the same thing was happening in the. I mean, what do you think the rack is, right? What do you think the rack is? Who used the rack? Who made the rack? Like, put the rack on the map. Spanish Inquisition. Right? The Inquisition. You will believe in God, our God, or else the rack. And then we'll twist your body out of shape and you become like deformed. The rack was supposed to make you deformed physically. So there is something to do, some evil satanic practice in deforming the natural harmony of God's handiwork. Right? Like your body and you were made to be like this, but they'll deform you, they'll turn you into a stunted child that's small and twisted and weird and not right, or deform your body as much as possible to twist you out of shape so that you're no longer reflecting the mathematics of God. Because there is maths to the human body, right? The human body has got a very profound mathematics to it. So there's, yeah, it's totally devilish, Okshi. It's, um, it's heavy. So this this... Um, Oh, somebody was mentioning Brahma. Um, I think it was... Am I right? 
maybe it was a while ago. Maybe he's left by now. But the question was about who was Brahma. So Brahma is an interesting concept because Brahma relates to the... Firstly, there's different notions about Brahma in the Rig Vedas and different parts of the Vedas. And the Brahma is very often considered to be sitting in Muladhara Chakra with four faces facing in four directions. So representing the four aspects of physicalization. And so on one hand, Brahma represents intelligence, information in its pure form. Think of like the proverbial code of the universe that becomes manifest. That could be considered as Brahma. Where um, Shiva and the Brahma and Vaishnu are, you got to understand physics to understand these three principles because in India they have a, a wonderful way of putting it. They, they, they speak about um, um, God. So they say the generator, the destroyer. That's Brahma's generating reality and Shiva's destroying reality. And the O in the center is Vaishnu, who is regulating reality, observing reality and keeping it regular between the creation and destruction. So we could think of the forces of um, anentropy as being Brahma's reflection in the world. We can think of the forces of entropy as being Shiva's reflection in the world. And we can think of the forces of harmony as being Vaishnu's reflection in the world, which is why Vaishnu's avatar is Krishna, which is why when the Catholics discovered the Gita, they believed sincerely that it had been plagiarized from their Bible. I don't know if you know this. There was a big belief that the Gita had been plagiarized from the Christian Bible because the notions were so similar. Because Krishna is uh, the avatar of Vaishnu being the maintainer of life. So the forces of life are related to Vaishnu because life is about the balance between creation and destruction. And destruction and death is Shiva, which is why the crow, Kakpushundi, is one of Shiva's most you know, loyal devotees, if we can call it that. And Brahma, Brahma re represents a very unmanifest. In a, in a way, Brahma can be considered as the non-manifest form of Manu. <clears throat> and Manu represents what in Western occultism can be considered as Adam Kadman, which is the group oversoul. So we think of ourselves as being individual souls, but our individual souls are connected to each other because we're not separate. And the connections between us create an oversoul reflection of existence. And we are all within that oversoul connected to other oversouls that connect to form greater oversouls. And so we, we're looking at the, at the reflection of astrological powers that are bound by angelic powers that are bound by archangelic powers that are bound by archetypal powers. And so these four divisions, all four of these divisions fall within the field of Brahma, for Brahma is what brings them into being. And Shiva, Shiva is the fifth element of this which is reflecting this back at each other. So Saturn is the number eight, but the number eight is a, uh, is a conjunction between four coming into being and four coming out of being. And Shiva represents that fifth element. So Shiva's element is Akash, which is why the Naga, the, the, the cobra, is bound around his Visuddhi chakra, because in the Visuddhi Chakra, we have access to the Akasha, which is that, that um, field of vibrational resonance from which all of reality is downloaded. So, um, I'll try not to get off on one. But um, 
yeah, it, it, there's there's so much astro theology in all of these religions that we can see, and um, it's 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 interesting how like you'll find very often Christian religion will deny the fact that it came from Catholicism, which it did, and Catholicism will deny the fact that it it's a reflection that comes out of Judaism, which is what it is, and Judaism will deny that it came out of out of um, um, Arcadian religion, which is a Zoroastrian type of religion. We'll deny it, like, out flat, but it, it did. And these traditions evolved out of um, Babylonian religion traditions, which it did. And if you were to be able to go back in time and speak to the Babylonians, they would probably deny that their religion evolved from Sumerian religion, which it did. <laughs> which is why the um, Tetragrammaton, the name of God, um, the first two letters of the name of the Tetragrammaton is Ea. And that is actually a name of Enki in Arcadian. So the name of Enki in Arcadian became the first half of the name of the Tetragrammaton, which is the basis around which Judaism revolves, which is where Christianity came from. And its roots go right back to Sumeria, to Enki. So, and this, this is linguistic. This is not an opinion. This is acknowledged by linguists all around the world. That this, this, is, this is the line of, of, of etymology. This is the etymological evolution of the words and that all the language essentially came from Sumeria and moved through um, basically Chaldea where the Chaldeans evolved the language to become phonetic rather than um, based upon um, the, where the, the, the letters were particular sounds rather than concepts where in older times the letters were concepts and not particular sounds. So the phone, phonem, phonetic nature of language came into, into um, extension in the Phoenician era. So the, but they were expressing the astrological principles in the language, which is why when you look at those old languages, it consists of three letters, three mother letters. This is the, the um, Paleo-Hebrew, which is where came directly from Chaldea, which is the three mother letters, the three principles of the Trinity, which is bound by the seven principles, which is three things can become seven personalities. This is math. If you've got one, two, and three, or if you've got A, B, and C, you can have A, B, C, or A, B, or A, C, or C, B, or a, B, C. That's seven. Seven possible combinations. It's numerological. It's mathematics. Um, so the seven is binding the three. And then the seven consists of, as we said before, polarities of the five, Mercury, the, the, pent, the Pentecost, right? Um, which is the two sets of polarities of fives bound by the Ouroboros, which consists of the sun and the moon. Now we're going back to Chemian logic, which is hermetics, right? Where the rare is the the one eye, the right eye, and Isis is the left eye. Left eye corresponding to the right brain, right eye corresponding to the left brain, and right eye corresponding to the to the um, to the um, um, to the back brain, and the Left eye corresponding to the front. So we've we've got all these these. Sorry, I've got those two inverted. But the, these four principles are the four faces of Brahma once again, and the four faces of Brahma, as we know, are the four elements that are moving through fixed, cardinal, and mutable. Fixed, cardinal, and mutable. Four sets of fixed, cardinal, and mutable. So the Trinity extracts four possible potential. Um, incarnations so we are said to be living in the fifth age of man right 
So we can see how all of these numbers in the religions seem to be reflecting some kind of a cosmic harmony that we can see in the stars. So there's definitely, it's very hard to deny the astrotheological basis for much of what has become doctrine in the religion, even though it's exoterically taught by people that maybe don't understand the esoteric significance of what they're saying because they haven't studied and they themselves are ignorant because they've studied only what they were told to study, how they were told to study, only believed what they were taught to believe and didn't look outside of their little tunnel vision that they were given to study in. And that's an easy way to control someone's mind, stop them from thinking, um, stop them from asking questions, because when you read the Bible as a book, you start asking questions, naturally, as a child. <laughs> My poor father. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so there's, there's, there's definitely this story happening. Um, so what, what do you guys think? I'd love for you guys to give me your final. I've given you my final long chapter. Um, what do you guys think as, as your closing chapters out? But don't, don't feel rushed. Take your time. What would you like to, to? I wanted to mention how uh, we, we kind of uh, talked about a lot of dark side of religion and bachelor of religion a little bit. But uh, I wanted to um, kind of just put a question out there just to the audience and, and something to ponder like, um, you know, we have like prophets and we have mystics that are able to commune with a higher consciousness and um, be able to explore uh, higher dimensions of the mind. And that's something that not everybody can do. Now, these people, a lot of times, um, they didn't even write anything down. Uh, they just spoke to people. And so oftentimes their message was misconstrued in some ways and lost in the shuffle somehow. Uh, the way it's been interpreted over the years through all the translations makes it even harder to get back to the root of what was really tr trying to be conveyed. But a lot of that stuff was preserved in mysticism. Um, but in the religious paths, it's kind of been just used as a like a puppetry to lure people in like a bait. They use some truths that that, are, that hold ground to bring people into a philosophy that doesn't hold understanding. It's it's kind of a conclusion without a premise and substance to it. Like this is our conclusion based on what we're just going to say the substance and premise are good. We're not going to say what they are. And you're going to have to go along with what we're doing here. And so they use that line of thinking to, to bring people into to religion sometimes, which can be trouble. But I think what they're really could have you know good intentions that may go wrong in a lot of places but i think some people are able to be able to reach that higher consciousness and be able to commune with with a higher spirit or something of the sort and it's it's like the there's a simulacrum going on where there's they're trying to convey a spiritual rebirth which is is misconstrued by the sacrifice of the sun um, the sun sacrifice and crucifixion may or may not have happened, may or may not be a symbolic or figurative event. Um, it seems like a lot of people have found that Isa or Jesus um, actually was exiled and went back to Kashmir in Rosa Ball and uh, actually left instead of being executed but that he had to be executed according to the story of the Christ, which was a later re-representation and repackaging of the story that happened in, in Greece. But uh, I think that there's something important to be learned by, by understanding the message that was lost, um, that we can have a spiritual, everyone can have a spiritual rebirth, uh, whether it's through ego death or through uh, what may have happened uh, to Jesus, um, a, mock uh, a mock crucifixion and um, a burial in, for three days in which he was induced into a coma and then uh, was able to talk to God and then given the antidote and brought out of that in a secret ceremony that's preserved in, in secret societies today, um, but not allowed to be known by the public. 
um, and being able to go through that, which is a very challenging and trying ceremony, being able to not move and be paralyzed and awake for three days and then reawaken um, in that ceremony. Uh, you know, that that's not something everybody would choose to go through. So, and it takes a year uh, of the people that are inducted to do that just to be able to see if they can trust them. And then they go through another two years of practices to be able to go through it. Uh, according to the secret uh, rites of the, the Knights Templar and the 33rd degree and higher uh, Freemason city. But um, I also wanted to mention that um, a lot of religions are one-sided and philosophies as well. Um, but uh, there's Taoism is often more open to different lines of thinking and, and has an understanding of the value that Taoism uh, suggests that the Tao itself is a mysterious source of all things can be interpreted in numerous and in innumerable ways by every everyone. So we all have uh, value in being able to trying to understand the different ways in which we in interpret the same thing. So we can see value in that and, and it can bring light to our understanding of our own personal way of seeing things. But of course, there's always going to be ways where that can be misconstrued and people will see things differently. But there is uh, a lot of of part of the doctrine that that mentions that uh you know other other ways of thinking are not to be judged and it's more about personal transformation and personal personal embracing of 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 effortlessness not trying to make an effort of things so hard and trying to go along with things more um and trusting and having faith in knowing that there's guidance there and trusting your intuitions. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Also, uh, we, we, we've been talking about uh, astral theology, and I wanted to mention uh, Haimarmin, um, which is the goddess Haimarmini, the goddess of the fates, the fates being like the constellations, the, 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 the astral bodies, the planets, and such um, that, that rule us through our, our um, astrological um, deficiencies that we have, we have these these fates that we can change into a destiny if we understand ourselves. Um, but through self-understanding, we can understand what things we need, our weaknesses that we need to work on and how to go about doing that. So that's something that's kind of been lost too. That That's something that was often suggested to be um, some of the things that, that are not understood as judgment. But it's, it was supposed to be the the fates of the stars. Um, so also, uh, there's the I wanted to mention that we were talking about the Anakim earlier, and uh, we have Goliath, and he had four brothers. Um, Ishbibinab was one of them, who was killed with a spear, I believe. Uh, they were the sons of Rapha, according to the story. And so I think there's associated with the Raphaim, but I'm not sure. But the, one of the things is that they have uh, Anakim relatives. And, and, and that's known because uh, he, he also was brought up in Gath, which is an ancient stronghold of the Anakim. And so um, his people were there uh, and, and were known to have Anakim relatives. So... Uh, yeah, that's a lot about what I wanted to get to. Sorry if we went over a little bit. Well, thank you, brother. Beautiful, beautiful share. Beautiful, beautiful share. Um, a few things you said was, one thing I, I noticed that you said, I'm just going to shortly respond to it before Dr. K throws his wisdom at the table, is you mentioned uh, the Tao. And it's interesting how even Tao has its astrotheological principles. For example, not so often, it's not so obvious, but uh, when you're practicing the microcosmic orbit, for example, you have to align with the pole star. And the, the shin that you take in, you actually have to take it in from the pole star and circulate it through your chi channels, specifically in order to be aligned with the pole star. And the pole star, we, I, I can't believe we didn't mention this. This is the, the axis mundi, 
right? <laughs> this is the shaman's totem pole that you're dancing around. When you dance around your pole, that's the axis. Mundi, that's the world axis. Everything is revolving around this fundamental pivot, pivotal reality, we could call it. And so this pivotal reality, which is the, the center of the wheel that's revolving around it, which is why we see obelisks all around e Egypt, right? Um, and in ancient world, obelisks were such a big deal because they were representations of the, of the Axis Mundi. And that was how we were able to tell time. So the Saturnian circle was cast around the Axis Mundi in order to be able to keep track of time. And so this, you know, these obelisks were clocks, and um, so that's with that's with um, rem remembering as well. Even the most philosophical systems seem to have their roots in the astrological, and seem to be fundamentally focused on the astrological. And like, let's not forget who Orion is, right? Or light, ion, the ions of light. The construct the, the nature of space time are basically the confluence of light from the stars and stardust resonating with particular frequencies when bound in the substrate of light. But enough of that. Dr. K, what about you, brother? Well, I would love to say, first and foremost, thank you for the space, Franklin. Uh, it's been a wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you for what you just dropped in, D, because um, people people have to step out of their paradigms. People have to understand that there's truth also in the shadow as well as the light. Um, and I would just like to offer um, a little bit of scholarship, um, a, little, um, a few of the books that helped um, point me in the right directions, so to speak. There's a wonderful book um, by Lars Gimstead. That's L-A-R-S-G-I-M-S-T-E-D-T. -E um, I, Yeshua, Awakener. It is a wonderful story about uh, Yeshua, Emmanuel, Jesus, Issa, whatever you want to choose to call him, Christ consciousness, Christ, um on his journeys through India, learning the ways of the shaman. Not many people know about this book. This book got me in a great deal of, of trouble in the uh, seminary as a, as a young boy. I cannot recommend it highly enough. Um, there's a wonderful series of books called The Astrological Foundation of the Christ Myth by Malik H. Jabbar, um, volumes one through four. Um, it shows you exactly how the foundation of astro theology gave way to create this myth of a, a, a so-called sun deity. Um, he's also the author of Lifting the Gnostic Veil and the Secret Origins of Judaism. Um, I cannot recommend those highly enough. Um, the World's 16 Crucified Saviors, Christianity Before Christ, by Kersey Graves, and that's Kersey with a K. Um, he gives you closer to 42 um, sun deities, from Dionysus to Osiris, Osar, um, Quetzalcoatl, so many, so many others, and gives you the attributes. Um, in more recent years, there was a documentary called Zeitgeist, which you can still find on YouTube for free. I believe they have the first four, or maybe the, maybe, maybe the first three volumes which is a great deal about um, uh, astro theology. And finally, I would recommend uh, Black Man of the Nile, um, Chronology of the Bible, and We the Black Jews by Dr. Yosef Ben Yakanan, uh, affectionately known as Dr. Ben. Um, he was one of the first to speak about the correlations uh, the, the actual origins and show the Masonic influence and where that actually came from in terms of religion, in terms of astral theology. Um, I cannot recommend those enough. That's just a few. I guarantee you, if you just search for those, you will be led to 
many, many more. Um, and I wish you, thank you for the space, the opportunity to share. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day and evening. Love, peace, and power. Peace Bless and you, power. brother. I bet that black man of the Nile they're talking about was originally probably Moses, David, and and, and Emmanuel. It's funny how the racist ideologies have come out of these you know, these Western cosmological slants because you see like a white Jesus everywhere you go, right? But when you go to Palestine, there's like people's skin, they're not white. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And Emmanuel was a Palestinian, right? So it would look like Palestinians look. And they got brown skin. So, do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It's quite funny when you look at it. You've you got to giggle. And it's like I'm, I'm always reminding my son when he goes to church that um, any graven image of God on the wall of a, of a church is called an idol. So if you take a cross and you put it on a wall, and you put a man on the cross and you hang it in a church as being a representation of God or of God's influence on earth, then that's an idol. No different to a cow. I always like to remember that um, because I've, I've often heard people from different Christian traditions saying, oh, that." That's an idol. Those are idol worshippers. And then they go into their church and pray in front of the cross and pray to the cross. And I find that funny, personally, because, you know, it's, it's easy to point, to point fingers and say, look at those Hindu people. They're idol worshippers. Come, let's go and pray to the cross. You know, uh, because they, they've got a cow and you've got a cross. And, and without recognizing that the cross is actually Saturn's emblem, Saturnalia. Why is Christmas in the date that it's in? Maybe it's got something to do with Saturnalia. That's why there's a cross, Saturn's cross, at the, at the core of the religious iconography. And that the, the, the date of Christmas has literally replaced Saturnalia. No coincidence there. And that it had to be on a cross. And not just any cross. Because that particular cross, right? Because the dimensions of that cross, it unfolds a cube, the black cube of Saturn. So, you know, you, you, you just can't escape it. The very cross that's on the walls of most churches is the black cube of Saturn that's been opened up. And that's why Christmas is when it is. <laughs> so... It's good, it's good to, to be aware of these things and um, not to judge one group or another. Like, not to judge um, Vedic people, not to judge Buddhist people, not to judge Christian people. Um, although, unfortunately, people are always very in a, in a hurry to judge, to point fingers at other people and say those ones are bad and these ones are good and those ones are bad. I think everybody's a little bit good and bad. What do you think, Soraya, dear? I hope you're with us. Yeah, I'm with you. I feel the same way. I recently removed something from my grave that can respect other people for what they believe. Because I feel that it's not your place to judge. Because if you, if you come into my room and you shut the first post you do is an anti Semitic post, you're wrong. Your voice is very soft, dear. Wait a second. That's better. I said, I said recently I removed someone from the group, from my group, who uh, the first post that the person shared was an anti Semitic post. The second one was one was an anti anti Christian post, and the third one was an anti Muslim post. So I was I was like, "You're you're gone." 
And I really made a post, like, anyone that discriminates, I don't give a shit what kind of group you are in, you get escorted out. Yeah, I know. That, that person was just obviously looking for trouble. Like, they're just yeah, really they to make a lot of enemies. So I was like, uh, out with you. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, people have forgotten the line of respect. It's a problem yeah. that I have with a lot of this younger, especially the younger generation. Yeah. Because they, they don't know what respect is. And I'm sure, yeah. like, all of us here can relate, especially like the guys, we can relate to it on a very visceral level, right? In our days, like respect mattered between guys, otherwise it was a it was a knuckle off. Yeah. Like you got hurt, people got hurt if there wasn't respect. But these days, fighting is such a taboo that people just get away with murder. Yeah. Like in the old days, if, if you said something bad about someone's girlfriend, you could you, there was going to be a fight. Yeah? These days, it, we're too civilized to fight, but at the expense of respect. Because um, very often men don't know where to draw the line because they're testosterone. And um, that's the reality, I think. Very often it's a, it's a guy. It's not so often a woman that does that, is it? Not that it, you can say that it's just men or women, but it's more often in my experience, it's normally some guy who's just trying to like, um, I don't know, show off. Is there anything anybody else wants to say about... The astrotheology, the topic, anything else that's come up before we say goodbye and sign off? Yeah, I would love to offer a response. I don't want to mispronounce the name in the chat, but the person who said that God saved me and will lead me to the right path, you cannot be led to the truth when you are the truth. Anywhere I stand is holy ground. But that's going to take a level of perspective that that religion will never give you. Yeah, um, I suppose in some metaphysical sense, the spirit will lead us all on the path we need to go through in life. Because like Cosmic was saying, we're living in a universe of soul. The universe is the expression of the soul because it can't express, it can't exist. If there's no soul, the whole universe is like an inside out soul. If, if that makes sense. So it's going to guide us towards the spirit, whether we like it or not, whether it's a bit in the nose <laughs> or whether it's with a stick or whether it's with a carrot. I think that our, our divine intelligence is operating within us, through us and um, wants us to find the truth and that the truth isn't going to look the same for everybody. Maybe that's something to remember. The truth is going to look a little bit different for every different person. Cause like cosmic was saying, we do exist in, in parallel little universes of our own. And so each universe is a different perspective of reality of the truth. And so each truth is not going to look the same as every other truth. And some truths are going to look very different to other truths, but they're still going to be truths within them, within their own matrix of truth. So the truth, the truth is the truth, no matter what we call it and no matter where we look, even even if we look into the most mundane form of religion, we can look into the Bible in the canonical form. We can look to John 1034. Is it not written in the, in the law that ye are gods? Right. So, you know, Jesus said he didn't come to change the letter of the law. Nobody likes to talk about that. Right. So if you want to give your power away to these entities that are outside of yourself, oh, they're waiting for you. But that's just power to be reclaimed. No matter where you look, there you are. The ignorance of that is what we're trying to fight here. And that is all. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Word, word to the brother. Um, definitely a lot to take in, you know, this whole conversation about the astrotheology. I think we're probably going to end up having a sequel to it at some point. Um, probably going to go down specific avenues of astrotheology, which I think is going to be an interesting adventure at some point. Maybe looking at the Sumerian connections and break that down and really hammer it out there, because I think there's so much to be discovered in those very ancient stories. For example, there is the story of Noah. What was Noah's name? I actually saved my voice note of it saying it, I believe. I think it's, I hope it's on this phone. I could uh, be wrong. Una Pishtim? Yes. Or is it a Sudra? Yes, Una Pishtim. Yeah. And, um, so the story of Una Pishtin is, is a way, let's just start by saying it's a much better written version of the story. And it's got a lot of the, the, the gaps filled in. Yeah. And the Noah part of the story is, um, it's clearly a plagiarism. And the, there's a lot of these stories that we can find in the um, canonized version of the Old Testament, which are essentially Sumerian stories that are being retold. Many, many, many thousands of years later, one imagines. Although there's no real way to know the time scale, uh, because people did live for quite a while in those days. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. K. Thank you to, to um, Aaron. I see him here in the chat. Thank you to, to Indy. Thank you to Soraya and Cosmic, and thank you to Slick, Pretty Slick's uh, um, audio equipment was going all over the shop and his connection, his internet was, was off. And thank you to dear Jeremy with his beautiful little girl and to everybody else that was in the chat. Love, peace, harmony to you all. And, of course, um, Mooney was in the chat with us. Thank you for bringing your beautiful energy. And God bless all of you for bringing your wonderful insights, your opinions, your ideas, your questions to the stories so that we were able to have this wonderful conversation. Love, peace, honor, and harmony to everybody. And let's all learn to work together because the stars work together. And I think the stars are the source of all of the iconography that basically are the structure of all of the religions. So we are all essentially telling the same story, the story of the heavens. And so we're all underneath the heavens, being turned around by the wheel of the heavens. We may as well work together the way the stars work together, the planets and all of the heavenly bodies that dance around this zone of reality that we call life. So much love to you all. Om Shanti. Om Shanti.